welcome members, officers and the public here in the gallery and watching the webcast of today's meeting of the London Assembly plenary meeting. The Assembly is the voice of London, composed of 25 members elected at the same time as the Mayor in order to hold him to account and scrutinize his policies. This is a plenary meeting of the Assembly, which means that all members are invited to attend. Members are reminded that any electronic devices should not be placed in front of the microphones, which must be turned on to speak and turned off once finished. Uh, Rebecca, can you please let me know if there are any absences, or sorry, any apologies of absences? Uh, thank you, Chair. We have apologies for absence from Assemblymember Ahmad, Assemblymember Duval, and Assemblymember Rogers. Thank you. Can I now provide an update to, on some of the recent activity of the Assembly? We last met for a full assembly to mark the passing of Her Majesty the Queen at a special service of remembrance here at City Hall. I know we all send our condolences and best wishes to His Majesty King Charles III. As a result, assembly work was curtailed for the official mourning period. However, the chairman of the Police and Crime Committee responded to the news that two metropolitan police officers were stabbed and sent to London and also responded to the publication of the report by His Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services into the Metropolitan Police. The Housing Committee discussed the government's latest housing reforms as well as levelling up agenda. The Budget and Performance Committee began the budget scrutiny process by discussing the Mayor's budget guidance for year 2023-24 and also wrote to the Mayor outlining a series of improvements to be made to the GLA group budget and reporting processes. And the Fire Resilience and Emergency Planning Committee met to discuss a report by His Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services, which found the London Fire Brigade requires improvement in several important areas. The Chairman of the Transport Committee made statements on the resignation of the Transport Commissioner and the announcement from the Mayor of a loan facility for TFL. The Planning and Regeneration Committee published a letter to the Mayor on how we can strengthen his planning design guidance. The GLA Oversight Committee published its long anticipated report into the London Partners and the GLA Code of Conduct. And the Police and Crime Committee met to explore the issue of the missing children in London and also summoned the Mayor of London to appear before it over the Sir Tom Windsor review. Just this morning, the Health Committee met to examine the importance of everyday physical activity for the health of Londoners. We are also currently celebrating the Black History Month and supporting London's black community. Finally, Amiga Month ends on October the 12th, which is the day of the Americas and the Hispanics. A group of Spanish and Portuguese community leaders artists and diplomats are attending today's meeting and we welcome them to this, uh, to this community. If those assembly members who can remain at City Hall after this meeting for photographs with our guests, this will be very much appreciated. This will take place outside the chamber. Can I ask the assembly to note the recommendation set out at item number two? And can I ask the assembly members to declare any other disclosable pecuniary interests or other relevant interests where they relate to the items on the agenda for today's meeting. Thank you. We can now move on to today's principal business, a question and answer session on the legacy of the 2012 London Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. Joining us in the chamber, we have Sir Peter Handy, Chair London Legacy Development Corporation, Lynn Garner, Chief Executive of the LLDC, Jules Pipes, CB Deputy Mayor of Planning, Regeneration Skills, Roxana Fiaz, OBE, Mayor of London Borough of Newham, Dave Hill on London, on London founder and editor and author of the Olympic Park, When Britain Builds Something Big, and adjoining us remotely today is Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson, crossbench peer, in the House of Lords and Paralympian. So welcome to all the guests to this meeting. There will be a lead of question from me as chair to each of our guests 
and this is a tall task to ask, but please confine your answers to one minute. Because if I give five minutes to every one of us, we'll be here all evening. Um, who will have one minute to respond? Assembly members may then put supplementary questions to invite his guests. Um, please, could I ask Assembly members to ask to specify who they would like an answer from when they put their question? And guests, can I please ask for you to be succinct in your responses? The Assembly members are against the clock. They only have a certain amount of time allocated to them. So it's very important that you are succinct and answer the question uh, as, um, in as short words as possible, please. Um, the first question is for me to Sir Peter Hendy, and I will then come to each of the guests uh, briefly in turn. And the question is, a decade on, what has been the legacy of the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games and what challenges and opportunities still remain? Over to you, Sir, Hen Sir Peter. straight on the legacy first. Um, the legacy is widely regarded as one of the greatest legacies the world has seen in modern times, with the International Olympic Committee itself describing it as a legacy that keeps giving. It's become a blueprint not only for future host cities to see what a successful legacy looks like, but for cities around the world to learn from such a transformational, regenerational project. We've delivered thousands of high-quality homes and jobs across the right, wider area, secured the long-term legacy of five major sporting venues, a hub for innovation, an evolving legacy on the park, which now takes in East, East Bank, the most ambitious cultural and educational course in a generation. And the result of more homes and more jobs has also led to additional council tax and business rates being generated within the area, with an estimated 70 million receipts generated every year since 2005 and a forecast of 225 million by 2039-40. So that illustrates how the continued growth of the area will support the local economy. The personal stories of, of, of the people who live and use the park are, are really uh, very powerful indeed. I, I obviously haven't got time to say any of them, but if you ask the young people who come to our free summer school, who now work for the biggest names in culture and arts, the people who use the parklands, which are a life, lifeline during the pandemic, the kids who swim in the swimming pools, and the startups and social enterprises like Badu Sports, they're creating a real difference in the, uh, in, in the park. Those of you who've come this year will have seen that for yourselves. If you haven't come, please do. Um, and I'll, I'll finish by quoting from a previous mayor, who you can work out who it is, who said, I didn't bid for the Olympics because I wanted three weeks of sport. I bid for the Olympics because it's the only way to get the billions of pounds out of the government to develop the East End, to clean the soil, put in the infrastructure and build the housing. Um, and I think that's about a minute's worth. Great. Thank you. Lynn? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm going to cover off the challenges and opportunities uh, section uh, uh, there. So we have the challenge that everyone is facing at the moment of an uncertain economy and an uncertain economic outlook. The opportunity is that we are in a really strong place to drive recovery to aid London and the UK. The challenge to make sure that this is a regeneration that benefits everyone. The opportunity that we can already see through access to East Bank quality jobs and skills opportunities and innovation from the greatest universities. The challenge to deliver housing for everyone. The opportunity to drive forward the new mayoral policies and create buildings and communities which will stand the test of time through joint venture development partnerships on these occasions that keep any uh, financial surpluses within the public sector. We've set ourselves a challenge to reduce the burden on the public purse over time and get closer to financial sustainability for the park. Given what we have created, we have the opportunity to attract the best operators and sponsoring partners who really care about social, economic and sustainable outcomes. We have the challenge with the evolution of the Mayoral Development Corporation in 2025 to keep all our fantastic existing talent focused and motivated. The opportunity is for the wider GLA group and the boroughs to design a process so that we can effectively retain that talent between us. And finally, we have the challenge to make sure that the momentum continues. The opportunity here 
is through the partnership we have with stakeholders and local boroughs who share our aims and ambitions for a truly inclusive economy. Thank you. Jules. I'm probably going to have a problem this afternoon not addressing um, most of these questions with a former borough hat on rather than the hat I wear today. Um, I, I, I believe that no other development scheme, no other project that anyone could dream up anywhere in the world um, would have delivered the changes that the Olympics brought to that part of East London. Uh, the remediation of the land and the waterways, the undergrounding of the power lines that you know, l l led to the removal of about some of the 87 electricity pylons. The way that that landscape was changed and made it somewhere that people would want to go to, to live, work, do business, play, um, yeah. So I think that, that, that the, the, what you see, what you get there, um, I think is, is more than justifies the holding of, of, of the Olympics. Um, just so that I'm realistic though, did it achieve all that it could? Um, I think you have to answer those questions from different perspectives, local, regional, national. Um, uh, and as an example, nationally, one of the national promises was inspire a generation to take part in volunteering, physical and cultural activity. Did we achieve, did the country achieve that? I, I don't think it did at all, and I don't think anyone would claim that it did. So I think um, when, when we're trying to uh, assess successes, I think we've always got to look at it from, from uh, the, the establish what, from what perspective we're asking and answering those, those questions. To conclude with a local, my former local hat on, it, it did achieve everything that I expected that it would um, achieve because um, I'm a realist. I never bought into grand promises that it would transform everybody's life, even, you know, draw a circle, even a mile circle around, uh, you know, promises made if anyone ever was foolish enough to make them, that it would transform every, in, a, in a transactional way everybody's life. Um, I mean, that's for the birds. What I expected as a borough leader that it would deliver, it, it certainly, certainly did. Thank you. Yeah. Look, Simon. Just building on, um, thank you, uh, what Jules um, has set out in his introductory remarks, um, and I'm talking from the perspective of a borough leader that also happens to be chair of the Growth Boroughs Partnership, representing Hackney, Tower Hamlets, Waltham Forest, and Newham presently, and I'll be focusing focusing specifically on convergence because that was the big legacy promise around social economic convergence in order to address the issues of poverty endemic and inequality that exist uh, existed at that time and still exist remain enduring in East London without a doubt uh, the transformational physical uh, impact of the Olympics uh, can be evidenced the uh, elements of growth that have led to uh, a convergence with the London average around the socio-economic uh, dimension of this piece has happened. Uh, there has been growth uh, that now sits uh, above the London average since 20, uh, 2010, uh, alongside a reduction in the educational attainment gap uh, alongside increases in people, in work, uh, but there's more to do. Uh, in addition, there has been significant progress, as mentioned with regards to the Olympic legacy goal to achieve social economic convergence. Uh, and if you set that against the metrics that the government uses in order to ass assess the scale and depth of deprivation. There has been a dull shift, but it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge across the four growth boroughs that represent the Growth Borough Partnership that there remain some quite acute challenges relating to health, well-being, uh, inequity, and social economic inequity, which we are looking at addressing as we look ahead 10 years on, not 10 years back, towards how we can repurpose the mission of the Olympics, what was promised then, 
and what we need to continue doing now uh, and for the next decade ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, Dave? Okay. Um, uh, I can't speak about the, um, the, the sporting legacy or the volunteering. I'm not qualified to do that. I can only speak about the park and the sort of impact of the games for East London more generally. Um, the legacy story is still very much unfolding, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. There's probably another good 10 years of it to go before we can really assess what's happened. Um, but so far, I think it's been, in general, really good. Uh, you've got fantastic sports amenities, a reclaimed natural landscape, and that was an enormous task for the people putting the park together. Uh, we've got some new industries, more and better quality housing with, uh, thanks to the present mayor, a rising proportions of affordability. And we've got the emerging education and culture cluster, East Bank, thanks very largely to the previous mayor. Um, also, tr a variety of transport links serving East London happened much sooner than they would have, than, than they would otherwise have done had the games not made it absolutely important to move those things on quickly. And I think there's been a general energizing of the Lower Lee Valley area where I live, and I've lived for about 30 years, so, so I've sort of seen that going on in front of my own eyes. And on, on challenges and opportunities, I think one thing that's important to, to, to keep in mind is trying to maintain and, in fact, perhaps revive a bit a model for collaborative government <laughs> at all levels which enabled the games as a whole and the park to be delivered so successfully. And we saw, we saw very unusual levels of cross-party uh, cooperation and a working together between local authorities in London, regional government in, in London, and national government. And that shows what can, be, what can be achieved if people can agree to do things together. And it's important to, to remember that and try and keep it going in the new circumstances. Um, and just looking ahead, I think it's, it's just so important, it's an obvious thing to say, that it's important to do everything possible to ensure that as many local people as possible, especially, especially the young people of, of East London, uh, are aware of the opportunities that the, that the park and its uh, surroundings can offer them, and also truly believe that, they can, that those opportunities are for them. Because I think there's a, a sort of psychology at play here, which we might talk about a bit later, in terms of f people feeling that the park belongs to them. And um, lastly, just ensuring that future development uh, sort of within the park, but also in the vicinity of the park, as the boroughs get their powers, planning powers back, just finds that sort of right combination of economic effectiveness and community benefit which is a, a long convers a much longer conversation, but that's pretty much what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And remotely, can I ask Tenny to make a contribution, please? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and just for some added context, I was involved in the bid from 2002. I was uh, vice chair of the athletes committee for LOCOG, worked at Games Time, and then sat on the LLDC board. Um, the game set a really high bar. And I'm proud of what we've done, but a challenge is we expect much more of that dreaded word legacy now than we did at the time. And the reality is the 2012 strategy saw legacy in a very binary way. Um, and I think it's important to take into account the context of the time of the decisions that were taken as much as the way we look back on it now. Um, Jules mentioned Inspire a Generation. That was a tagline I absolutely signed up to. But there was a huge sense of realism with that as well. We can't expect a few weeks of the games on their own to say change the lives of disabled people, but it certainly can nudge the discussion on many of the areas that we want to change. So I think of legacy in, in three different buckets. It's the games themselves. It was a shop window, a pathway into sport for some people. It showcased the best of UK PLC, and it was a national celebration of something that was simply extraordinary. And without the games, things like Green Park and King's Cross would not be step-free tube stations now. But also I competed at five Paralympics and four Olympics. And what I saw at games time was just absolute genuine inclusion, not just the same look for the two games, but the same feel for every single athlete who was there. Uh, the second bucket I look at is the power of sport and physical activity and the interaction with community, you know, looking at social value, cohesion, breaking down barriers. The park is a really important part of that. And the work that the Global Disability Hub is doing is incredible. 
in terms of again nudging that conversation further on we wouldn't have had some of those things without the games but the third area is the health of the UK population and uh, this is where we have an opportunity to do something now uh, not just on the back of Covid but but actually doing something incredible so what we need looking forward is bespoke targets for walking cycling running fitness and actually using 2012 not as an end point or a 10 or a 20 year anniversary but as a building block to do something very different for our society thank you very much whilst i was listening to your answers i was reflecting to the challenge i said to you of the one minute challenge which you did very admirably well, admirably well but i was reminded of a comment by voltaire he wrote a long long letter to his friend the last sentence of the letter was if i had more time I will written you a shorter letter, just saying how taxing it is to give short answers. So thank you very much for, for doing that. The first supplementary question is from Assemblymember Sakina Sheikh. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon to the panel. It's great to have you join us here today to discuss the legacy of the London Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. Um, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Jules, about needing to assess this on a regional, local and national scale in terms of what we've achieved. But I'm going to be zoning into the local a little bit. And I wanted to actually start with yourself, Lynn, about asking, has the Olympic Park met the regeneration commitments for the host boroughs? And then I might move on to yourself, Roxana, as chair of the uh, growth borough partnerships, but also feel free to lean into Newham specifically. Um, actually, uh, Roxana's talked about the convergence ambitions that the growth boroughs had. At the time, there were six growth boroughs that signed up to uh, the convergence indicators. And she's explained how quite some progress has been made in uh, some of those, but not so much in others, particularly those around health and well-being. So that was one monitoring framework, if you like. Uh, my understanding is that there were also five specific Olympic promises that were made back in 2007. And we still monitor ourselves against those. We've done uh, quite well against those. I could give you the headlines of what they are very quickly. So one is the world-class sporting nation. We've spoken a bit about sport and uh, there have been some difficulties around that in the sense of changing the na nature of the uh, entire national population towards sport is a, is a big ask. But there, was a, there were a huge number of local people involved in sporting activity in the, in the immediate years and um, following the Games up to 2014 when a lot of money went in from Sports England to help with that. And that was both in um, uh, general sports, but also quite a focus on uh, sports for disabled people um, and this, this spin-off for the Global Disability Hub has been interesting from the Paralympics which has been hugely successful. The second was to transform East London. Now under the heading of Transform East London we would trot out all of our targets for house building and targets for jobs and so on, all of which we do uh, we're doing quite well against and we're on target to achieve all of those headline targets for jobs and, uh, and outputs in that regard. Uh, we've created two new business districts and so on and East Bank brings a whole new plethora of benefits in terms of arts, culture and education obviously. Um, the third was to inspire a generation in volunteering and physical and cultural activity. Uh, there is a lot of volunteering goes on in the park actually we still have over 400 volunteers some of whom have been with us since games time and have stayed uh, i uh, speak to a lot of them personally on a regular basis many people moved home to east london from different parts of the country uh, after experiencing games time games time uh, volunteering which blows your mind actually that you know it really meant that much to people um, and they've given 76,000 hours um, since the Games in their free time uh, uh, to, to volunteering on the park. And they get involved in all sorts of stuff, planting, helping us with mobility and so on and so forth. They're fantastic people. Lynn, I might, if you don't mind, ask Roxana to cover the, the other uh, yeah, no, sure. aspects of it. And maybe you could sort of wrap it up into also what you think the future priorities would be. As the Chair mentioned, we're ever so slightly chain and ball yeah, by our fine, stopwatch. Fine. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Just your mic, Roxana. Thank you so much. Um, I keep on forgetting. 
really pertinent question and if I've understood it correctly the park whether it's met its objectives in terms of legacy um, I think the answer I would say is in two parts one um, the vision for the park um, as it was being conceived um, and the great estate that it contributes to the wider capital uh, landscape and it's a popular destination for Londoners from across the capital but more importantly it's actively used by local people from across the growth boroughs mm. as per presently iterated and it has been an area that we've discussed at length both uh, within the Growth Partnership Board, um, but also on the London Legacy Development Corporation Board. Mm -hmm. How do we cur curate the appropriate range of activities uh, that will be appealing and attractive to the diverse communities mm -hmm. that live in the localities, be that Hackney, be that Newham, and you are beginning to see even more of an upward trajectory. So it's very much valued, very much loved. Um, but there's always scope to do better and more. Uh, and that's very much informing the thinking around 10 years from now and beyond the vision of the geography that we know as the Queen Elizabeth Park and everything that's emerging and has emerged, not least the cultural offer that will be driven uh, and provided through the East Bank um, uh, institutions that will be coming we've got the vna we've got the bbc studios uh the opportunities that that provides both in terms of an experience uh as well as um work mm. um lynn mentioned uh business districts there's the innovation district that's emerging that will be you know a pioneer and a driver of the future world of work, the way in which the Olympic Park itself links to the Lower Lee side, which um, is being transformed and then taking that to actually this area of London, the Royal Docks, and how in quantum terms that represents a significant uplift in investment, jobs and a material lift in people's lives. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to hand back to the chair, but I look forward to hearing more of your contributions as the afternoon goes on. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, th thank you. And the next question is by Assembly Member Pigeon, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to ask my first question to the Deputy Mayor, um, given your, com your contribution at the start, because Section 1.4 of the original bid document promised these four great legacies, sport, community, environment and economy. I really want to try and focus on sport today. So let's look at the Olympic Stadium. The legacy for sport really centred around the stadium itself. The big document, if you look at it, promised conversion to a 25,000 seat multi-purpose venue with athletics at its core. It will become a house of sport with training facilities, offices and sports science and sports medicine facilities. In fact, as we all know, the Olympic Stadium is home to West Ham United Football Club and a few other bits as well. Deputy Mayor, do you think Londoners should be content that the principal physical sporting legacy of the world's greatest multi-sport event is a football stadium when London already has six other Premier League grounds plus Wembley Stadium? Well, we could, we could absolutely take not just the rest of the two hours, but the next two weeks discussing uh, the stadium. <laughs> or, uh, or several hours reading this very good book as well. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that I, 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 I'm not going to receive any payment for this, but I, I absolutely say to everyone they should read that, yeah. they should read that book for, the, for, for um, an awful lot of the history about mm. what behind where uh, London ended up with um, on, on the stadium. Um, I was perhaps a bit of an outlier at the, um, and always have been on, on that issue that I, I absolutely accept the rationale uh, that people made for the decision and that, that, and that the argument that it would be an empty dust bowl if it had mm. been 25,000 uh, seat uh, stadium, as it had uh, uh, athletic stadium, as had been the intention in the legacy community scheme that had been mm. adopted in about 2007. Um, 
I'm a bit of an outlier because I think it could have been made to work with imagination. It wasn't going to be um, uh, just left in isolation like you see in some legacies around the world where, uh, in legacies in inverted commas, where you do get these abandoned facilities mm. on the outskirts. We could have done, had a development platforms around there. You know, there are people who have raised issues about, oh, well, the wind issues because it wouldn't have had. Well, no, that, um, I think that could have been sorted and we could have had a, a, a different legacy. But I am in a, I absolutely put my hands up that I am a absolute minority in this view and that, uh, um, uh, and it was justifiable, the decisions that were made. I mean, I always remember it when it happened, it's sort of uh, about 2011, 10, 11-ish, when it was the superstructure, the white superstructure rising up out of the ground. Mm. And as soon as that was finished, it was at that point that people said, oh, we can't tear that down. Yeah. And that was what caused the problem, because I think for the, particularly for the government, it was under new yes. government, I don't think they wanted to be seen to be the people who said, no, no, that wasn't the plan, it's got to come down. That allied with the un uncertainty that everyone else had about the 25,000-seater uh, option, it went down that road. Mm. And once it was going down that road, it was a buyer's market. Yes, Because absolutely. it was only ever going to be late Orient, not really, Spurs, or West, West Ham, Ham, and Spurs said, well, we're interested in the location, but not that stadium, we'll tear it down. So it yeah. failed the yeah. previous test. So you had a once, only one single yeah. interested tenant, and that that's is where, that's how we got where we are yeah. today. Quite right, thank you. Could I come to Lynn now? Because obviously West Ham receives an effective subsidy on each home match. It pays a fixed rent, but E20 is liable for most match day expenses and has responsibility for life cycle and maintenance costs. And if we look at the year 21-22, E20 made a loss of £31 million. And in the same year, West Ham played 27 home matches. So you could say match day subsidy is, is over £1.14 million. Um, obviously, there are other ways of calculating it as well, but that, that's a huge, huge loss to the taxpayer. Now, Boris Johnson, as Mayor of London, when he moved to this plan that they would rent um, the stadium, as it were, he stated the plan to rent out the stadium is a very good deal for the taxpayer. So, Lynn, do you share the former Mayor's view that this whole setup is a good deal for the taxpayer? I think it would be very difficult to say it's a good deal for the taxpayer, frankly. Um, having said that, we're dealing with something that was signed quite a number of years ago now. Um, m many of the people in this room, if not all of them, were not responsible and were not even around mm. at the time. I, just want, I do want to come to the figures, though, um, Caroline, because uh, you're quoting from the published accounts, and there are a couple of clarifications there. The way we monitor what happens in the stadium are twofold. One is the operating cost of the stadium, mm -hmm. so the, co you know, the cost of running the operation, which in 1920, which is the fairest way of looking at this because it was the last proper year that one can look at it because the operating cost has been up and down in 20 and 21. Um, in 1920, that figure was 17 million pounds loss, operating loss. The bigger number that gets added onto it includes the cost of borrowing to facilitate that operating loss and um, any capital investment that has gone in in that year. So 17 million would be the number to compare with an operating loss. Difficult to compare with 2020 because all football was behind closed doors. And so we had quite a good operating, we still had an operating yeah, loss, but it was a lot, a lot smaller. Better, you yes, remember yes. We, we came here and spoke about it. Yeah. In 2021, we had some football behind closed doors and some happening with crowds, mostly with crowds, but we didn't have any concert income and we had to compensate um, UK Athletics for not coming and they went to Birmingham in the end. So that was also an anomaly year. The next best comparator on the operating cost is therefore going to be 22-23. Yeah. And it is going in the right direction. We have had challenges with match day costs because of fan behaviour, but it's going in the right direction. And I expect it to be lower than 17 million, so that's first. Okay. The reason we reported 31 million is we've put a huge amount of money, eight million pounds this year, into a new West Stand, which is a whole new um, uh, stand in the stadium. It brings 1,700 more seats, um, but, 
but the, the key to it is it will reduce the revenue costs of moving the seats by one million pounds a year. So the big number includes all the capital investment as well and the costs of borrowing, and that's why it seems so mm. huge. So just a bit of clarity yeah. around the numbers. Perhaps there. you could write to us. I think we'd Absolutely. all be interested with that and detail. That out, yes. And finally, in my last couple of minutes, I wanted to come to um, Tanya Gray-Thompson, if I can, to talk about athletics, because the bid document promised to retain the stadium as an athletics venue. There's a tension there between football and athletics. Um, and as we know, reconfiguration for the World Athletics back in 2017 cost 11.8 million. I know you've managed to reduce the prices now in terms of seat changes, but it's still really very complicated. But the GLA also holds the Crystal Palace Athletic Stadium, which is smaller, it needs renovation. So, Tani, do you think London, in some ways, will ever see that 25,000 seat multi purpose venue with athletics at its core? Or should actually the athletics legacy look at transforming Crystal Palace to sit alongside? So, um, as an older athlete who has very fond memories of watching and competing at Crystal Palace, it is kind of the holy grail. People still talk about it. Um, if I go back to Olympic Park, I think it's the context of the timing of some of those decisions that were taken. There's what is expected for the Olympic Games. And at that point, we're driven by what the IOC wants, not necessarily what the IPC wants. Um, in building the main stadium, uh, at the time, there was a huge amount of disappointment that it wasn't going to be something that looked like the bird's nest in, in Beijing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then all the issues about whether there was going to be a roof on or a roof off and the decision was taken not to put a roof on to save money, but ultimately that that didn't. Um, and I think it was very easy that the time to say, yes, we will have athletics multi-use. The reality of who's going to run it and operate it and where that money is going to come from is is a real challenge. So if you look at what Sydney did is they turned their main stadium into a rugby ground. The warm-up track became the athletics track, and that didn't particularly work for them either. So we did have other examples of Olympic Paralympic mm -hmm. cities where they'd tried um, to do this. The track that's required for World Championships, uh, Olympics, Paralympics, is very expensive. Uh, it's not a training track. It's not good for training. It, it's not good for... Um, for runners to train on. So you're weighing up lots of different things at the time. So although there might have been some decisions which weren't ideal, taking in that into context with also the basketball venue. So we got criticised at the time for building a temporary basketball venue, the venue that looked a bit like a meringue. Um, it would have been cheaper to build a permanent venue, but actually nobody wanted to run it. So the copper box was the, the most mm. obvious option. So lots and lots of complicated decisions. Um, my heart says yes crystal palace would be a, a great venue uh to to redo but that, that is not a simple solution to what we're trying to do for athletics and i think if there's one thing we can learn with hindsight is being much more creative uh and nobody did it before us no other olympics did it before us in terms of taking that longer term view to what the park would look like afterwards so um i think there is more that we could do to think about what venues, whether we go down a German model, which is much more multi-sport than we have. There's been so many attempts in the last 40 years to do that, and the governing bodies don't buy into it. So that's potentially where government needs to step in. But this is part of a big decision about actually where do we go with the future of sport, elite sport, grassroots community, uh, which is more than just what's happening in London. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. The next question is from Assemblymember Berry. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so my first question is also to the, the Deputy Mayor. Um, and yeah, in terms of going for the Games in the first place, um, if Peter Hendy hadn't quoted Ken Livingston, I would have done, um, because it really is, it really is crucial that, that we didn't go for it on the point of sport. We did it because development of the East End was the main point. And that quote from Ken Livingston ends with, build the housing. So I want to ask about um, housing and, and particularly overcrowding to you now. Um, now, within the convergence framework that resulted, there were specific targets on a whole range of things. And one of the most crucial, in my view, was on reducing overcrowded housing. Now, when the last measurements of this were, were taken in 2015-16, less than half of the overall goals had been achieved, and the one for overcrowding had actually got significantly worse. So 
What is your response to this lack of progress on this really key outcome for Londoners of the Games? And can you explain what happened to the original convergence target for overcrowding, which seems to have been quietly dropped when the convergence framework was renewed in 2015-16? I think that's probably more a, a question that last bit for the for the current borough borough leaders. But I mean, the, I, I think the I, have, I will put that to the to yeah. I, th no. I think the, the problem. I suppose it comes back to how how, how I opened today that it, it's the context. I can't. I I think it would have been wrong if anyone had inferred that the Olympics was going to be an answer to the overcrowding. It makes a contribution, and may and and the boroughs had their convergence criteria and aims and to varying degrees much was made of how the Olympics would contribute to those but the Olympics itself and the provision of what something like 5,000 homes on the on the on the park were never going to be the solution to London's or even East London's overcrowding the boroughs overcrowding because there are too many other factors pushing in in the other other direction um, and, and, and I think that these are the, the, the aims, the, the growth borough aims uh, uh, that, under, that were underlying the convergence idea ran in parallel to the Olympics. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't put too much of a strong, a strong link between them. I mean, it, was a, it was convenient. You know, I, mean, I remember us trying to persuade the then mayor to incorporate it into various documents here at City Hall, which we succeeded to varying, varying degrees because it would help um, focus interest on the area and the importance of gaining that. Um, but as I say, as another example of it, of, it, of decoupling it, um, one of the convergence criteria was um, educational attainment. And uh, I would, I won't take up your time now, I would make a very strong case that it was what the borough did uh, 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 rather than anything the Olympics did to move on educational attainment um, uh, in that in that. Fair time. enough, that's, that's an interesting comparison. I mean, it, it, is, it is disappointing with all that land and all those homes being built that we can't demonstrate even a ripple in what is a really huge issue for so many people in the area affected by the Games. But I think you're right, I should put this question to the mayor of Newham. Could, could I just quickly come back, back and say, yeah, but uh, you've got to look at scale, and you've got to, and it was really you've got to unpack that in the numbers, the numbers of homes built in those air, in, in in the Olympic boroughs, the numbers in overcrowded homes, and the fact that the Olympic site only had about five thousand homes planned for it initially. It was only what was the affordable twenty percent whatever it was, I mean, the, uh, even if it was 30, as high as 35, this mayor's trying to drive it up higher with setting, setting it at 50%. So I think you have to unpack all the numbers to have a realistic discussion. Well, my, my next question is about numbers, so I need to move on. Um, so yes, Mayor of, Mayor of Newham, uh, Roxana Fiaz. Um, so overcrowding data has been a, a constant issue for us. Um, as I said, the last time it was properly measured in a report was 2015-16. Um, and I think the next chance we have to look at it in detail will be the census, um, which is coming through, but we don't have the detailed data yet. So I've taken um, a look, not at like, the bedroom standard or by tenure, but just the broad results by borough for the average number of people per home. And that has increased since 2011 for all the Olympics boroughs. And it's, it's fairly obvious from everything we know that these increases won't be evenly distributed. Um, so are you at borough level monitoring overcrowding in any other way and are you planning to use the more detailed data from the census to make the case for for any policy changes in the LLDC area maybe when you take over more of the planning role um, absolutely um, so in a similar way um, vein to what Jules has just set out it's very difficult to extrapolate from the housing delivery quantum that's been delivered in the Olympic Park when you're trying to assess the crushing effect of the housing crisis in London and in the Noom context so that everyone's um, alert. Uh, if I may, just to illuminate, we have some 37,500 people on our housing waiting list. We have 5,500 families comprising of 7,500 children in temporary accommodation, we have seen in the last 12 months alone a contraction of our housing supply for temporary accommodation by some 47%. Uh, 
uh, and we are characterised, like many other East London boroughs and boroughs across the capital, of overcrowding in homes, but in the Noom context also, the majority of our households uh, are, are uh, located in the private rented sector. Um, I would concur with what Jules has said. The housing delivery output of the uh, LLDC was in no way uh, going to contribute to the significance of the housing crisis and housing constraint in the borough. And of course, as the ONS data begins to come through, we will be looking at using that data in order to frame our housing crisis response locally. Um, and notwithstanding that, given the decisions that this current mayor of London has made with regards to what more can be extracted from the development schemes that are remaining, um, there are ways in which we can leverage our um, control of land in uh, the areas surrounding the Olympic Park. Can I take one example? There's the Rick Roberts Way site, which is part of the delivery geography around housing and working alongside the OLDC as well as the Department of Education. We're going to be able to deliver a £28 million new school, but more importantly, at least 450 new homes, of which 70% will be genuinely affordable in line with the definition of genuine affordable presently used by the GLA. So all of that will be... There will be a continued focus on what the ONS is saying around population growth uh, and how that's going to impact our housing character in Newham. Sorry, Chair, can okay. I quickly give some figures? I, um, I, I have a further question for you. Oh. In two minutes left, I'm afraid. <laughs> Maybe you can write to me with those figures. Um, I do want to just use my last couple of minutes, though, to come back to you, uh, Deputy Mayor, about provision of sites for Gypsy, Roma and Traveller Londoners. Um, the LLDC local plan has specific targets and monitoring around this need and, and providing some sites. But despite this, I'm, I'm having trouble finding real progress. The, um, the last two annual monitoring reports from the LLDC don't mention any new sites. And I know that the Bart Trip Street South site was allocated um, as a Gypsy Roma Traveller site. Um, with Section 106 money um, in 2014, but, but that seems to have been paused because Hackney are doing some work on it. Can you give me an update on progress at this site and also what might el else might be coming forwards to meet the commitments? Um, I'm not aware of the work at that site because I thought it had been walled out due to the pollution years ago. Uh, but again, that's probably one for either um, LDC or for Hackney directly. What I know is about, uh, about the, uh, in relation to, to, to travellers, uh, in relation to the Olympic site is the relocation of the 20 sites that were on a, uh, a 20 pitches that was on the dreadful site at Waterton Road and are now on three far more superior sites uh, in the same locality around the perimeter um, of, of the park. Um, it would have been uh, best all round if all, all, all uh, gypsies and travellers had been treated in the same way as, as Hackney did at that, that time is, is my view. And if I've got a moment left, the figures, I was just going to give you two figures just to put in context what we discussed before. Um, the, the, out of those 5,855 homes, um, only 2,000 of them were going to be affordable homes of any tenure. And uh, because the mayor's raised the affordable percentage in later schemes that came to him after he became mayor, that's increased to 2,342. That's the effect of taking the 35% to 50% I think on that's remaining a point schemes. you already made, though, with some figures attached. I'm really well, sorry. I'm really, no, I've got 20 seconds to go left. To, I just wanted to put that in context with the figures that the mayor of Newham you, gave as to the size of the problem. That is fair enough. Um, I now have 10 seconds left, and I think you suggested that um, the mayor of Newham might comment on the provision of Gypsy Roma traveller sites on site, because I'm aware of some of the re relocated sites. Bar trip sites Hackney, I was suggesting the Mayor of Hackney or was contacted. Okay, wherever. fair enough in that case. But there's, there's nothing coming forwards on the, on, on the park apart from where there's too much pollution is effectively what you said there. No, too, much, too much pollution is bar trip site. It's right next to the A102 um, mm. motorway. So that one's been ruled out and there's nothing else on in I remember it as that as having mm. been the case years ago. I don't know whether it's changed. Yeah.
why don't I drop you a line on what's in the local plan with regard to the plans for the Olympic Park and Gypsy and Travel Thank sites. you very much. That's yeah. going to have to be the end of my time. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And the next question is from uh, Assemblymember Bailey. Um, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, pa panel. Um, the Mayor's made uh, no secret of his desire for a, another Olympic Games, and he used the word to be the greenest games ever because we already have the kit. Do we already have the kit, though? As we know, the stadium is locked in a in a contract, a 99-year deal or something along those lines. So, would, so do we actually have the kit? Let, let me start with the, with the Deputy Mayor, and then I'll come to Lynn. I think any future bid for games, um, we would have to be very creative about how we did it in terms of it being multi-site. Um, it wouldn't be simply run on the same site with trying to replicate the same kit again. Um, the, you wouldn't shove out all the incredibly successful range of businesses and innovations and whatever that are going on at Here East, for example. You'd need to build another press and broadcast centre. Um, equally, there isn't the space for um, open. I'm happy to be challenged on this, but I don't think there's a space on the site for the amount of homes that you need to build for you know temporary accommodation that you then want to flip into uh, into flats in the way it was done with the the, the village. So it would have to be multi-site. Uh, I am just throwing out a straw model here. This is not something that has been discussed here in the building, but you could imagine having. Uh, OPDC, you could have the site in West London as a site for for um, the, the village, the Olympic Village. Some some of the temporary venues. Obviously, you'd use the temporary venue, uh, the permanent venues that are currently in the park. You'd have the velodrome, you'd have the copper box, you'd have the stadium, you'd have uh, the aquatic centre. Yeah, you'd have to put the temporary seating back in the wings of the aquatic centre, but that's a lot cheaper than by building a brand new aquatic centre. And crucially, because by the time any bid bid would come through, you would have um, uh, the uh, uh, HS2, Two, yes. you would then join with Birmingham, perhaps even beyond. So you could have a Birmingham multi-area London bid and make it more of a national games than a, a London games. So a creative, with a bit of creativity, you could make it um, a, a greener, uh, a greener, less expensive games than, than cities have done before. But, I, sorry, I, did, I should have made this point, my final point, I should have made this in my opening remarks, um, that, that, you know, that, that, that London's games were beyond any other games in baking in legacy, that most things were either temporary um, and then dispersed, the facilities dispersed across the country, or... Um, uh, you know, the, 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 their future use was factored in and it was retrofitted for the games and then then, then, then allowed to be used for, as its permanent use, you know, such as the, the velodrome. Um, no, other, no other country, I think, has succeeded to the extent that London did. And it really is only the stadium in which we have this ongoing problem, which it seems to be the case all around the world with Olympic stadiums. Lynn? Uh, yes, all of the operator contracts protect major events so that um, if London wants to host a major event, and you'll know that previously we've, we've, won, we, we've run the World Championship Athletics um, in the London Stadium, we have the ability to carve that out. I mean, luckily for football, that mostly takes place in the winter. So uh, we would be negotiating around the edges uh, therein, but there are uh, clauses in the concession agreement that will allow for that. Thank you. Another question for the Deputy Mayor. How do we um, prevent a, a future Games becoming a distraction from the legacy that we're trying to build? The Kerslake Review talked about that there's only been 923 homes built of the 5,700 promised. Wouldn't an, a second Games, uh, even just the planning for that, just the idea of that, wouldn't that then put a drag on, on delivering the legacy we're already trying to deliver? I don't think it would be a drag. I mean, the, 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 there's a trajectory of delivery in the LLDC park on, on those, those 5,800 homes, which, which will be delivered. Um, I, 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 I don't think we'd, we'd lose focus on, on, on that. There's a trajectory of build-out. It's, 
it's I don't think that would but, be but it would be it could be argued I mean the report talks about modest a disappointing and modest delivery of homes and if we're starting to now to have to raise money to do other things you know paying Birmingham paying people for contracts would that create a drag yes go, go ahead Lee. I can come in um, there uh, the remainder of the homes are scheduled to be delivered well before 2036 which is which I understand would be the framework for any uh, bid that we'd be talking about. Um, if the athletes village was not on the park and it couldn't be because we wouldn't have the space, then I don't think that it would we, we, this would necessarily get in the way just because of where the housing is positioned mm -hmm. um, because a, a considerable amount of it is just outside the park on Pudding Mill Lane near Pudding Mill Lane Station. Roxana mentioned Rick Roberts Way. There are a number of sites uh, closer in inside the park, but they will complete sooner in any case. So the, the phasing um, for, for those developments will largely deliver well before uh, we get anywhere near um, the next uh, pr projected Olympic Games for London if we were serious about that bid and took it forward. Thank you. And another question for the Deputy Mayor. You talked about much of the Olympic Games being um, you know, semi-permanent or, or there was a planned legacy. One of the things that was meant to be temporary was the Olympic supplement. And wasn't, was that meant to be done by 2016? Are we still paying that now? Olympics, we were a bit at odds what that's a reference to. The precept, it, sorry. Maybe, maybe let me oh, use those words, precept. Let me use those words, excuse me. Yes, we are. Uh, my understanding is we are still paying that and it was meant to be temporary. Would we get another supplement or? It would be a matter for the mayor at the time. So, so I know it's very early days in, in the planning of the mayor, but he has talked about a plan being going forward. Surely the finances are being looked at. What's the general direction? It's, it's far, far too early to, 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 to start discussing that. I certainly haven't been part of discussions about the financing um, of it. I mean, it's a, this is a, an idea that's being promoted at the time. People haven't been sitting down, costing and, 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 and planning. Well, I mean, I, I mean, as, I mean. I say that's why I was careful to say about straw model, about about a possibility of of how one could run it. You know, I haven't discussed that with the mayor, and you know, that's not a that's not a uh, that wasn't a readout of a serious discussion. That's ideas that float around in my head. Yeah, but I, 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 I've mentioned it to Peter. And <laughs> yeah, again, I'm not I'm not I'm not challenging your straw model. You made it quite clear what that is. But if we're paying this precept now, surely if we're talking about a new the potential growth of that sub or. Or, or even a new one, surely that should be looked at. Now we should be looking just to end this one, surely. Well, as, as I say, any future precept, um, if there were to be one, would be for for a future mayor. I, I couldn't, can't possibly comment on on that. No. It's a yeah, sh shame. We don't, we don't. We you know because there, there hasn't been costings. Um, yeah, it would be. Uh, yeah, I, I but I, I, that's why I'm suggesting that someone should be looking at, at re reducing that bill for us. Um, just to come back to Lynn, earlier on you talked about the stadium not being a good um, deal for the taxpayer, but you also made the comment that, um, um, the Deputy Mayor made a comment that it was a buyer's market. Was there any other deal to be made? I think if we look at the history of what happened, it was very difficult. Um, there had been a full OGU competition for the occupier of the stadium. Uh, Tottenham Hotspur had lost that competition. There were some technical reasons around legal challenges for um, the mayor of the day to decide to move away from the results of that competition and into a concession agreement position. Now, when the concession agreement was put to the market, there were very few bidders because Tottenham was not in the competition any longer. And therefore, this is what goes to the buyer's market piece in terms of any negotiation. I fundamentally believe that's um, left, us, left us in a tricky position. Um, it's a very good deal uh, for West Ham because we pick up all of the operating costs. Um, but it is, a, it is a fantastic asset for London and does make huge returns in terms of its multi-use when we look at the economic returns and, of course, how it's viewed globally is, is actually extremely, uh, extremely positive. 
Uh, we always seem to talk in here just about how much it's costing us. It, it, you make it sound like it isn't. Oh, oh it is. It is costing. Oh. It is costing okay. money, isn't it? But when we uh, are able to run events like Major League Baseball, and that makes a return for the economy of 40 million for two weeks activity, uh, the wider economy, I think we have to see the thing in, in a wider sense than simply the operating loss. That's the point that I'm making there. So you're saying it's, it, it is effectively a good deal for us because it... It's, it's seen hugely positively across the world as a, as a legacy project with the, with the stadium being the most important part of that. It's unfortunate that the finances mean that we make a loss. Um, if we look at it in the round, we would need to make a decision is, is, is it a good deal for London in the round given the benefits that we've had that have spun off as the catalyst for regeneration from the stadium project. The benefits, as the IOC say, is that the, uh, the eyes of the world looking at this project. And uh, Premier League football brings global eyes to the London Stadium every other week. That's important, you know, in terms, in terms, of, in terms of that piece. So I, I think there's a balance. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, sorry, Chair, I would say that there was really, with hindsight, there was something of inevitability about it because that's why it was proposed that it would only be a 25,000-seat athletic stadium, and that was, that was what was proposed uh, to be, to be subsidised, which would have been a lot lower cost. Mm -hmm. You know, the rules of the game were completely changed back in 2010, 2011, where you've got a much bigger, hugely more complicated, uh, hugely more expensive um, stadium to, to deal Mayor, with. Uh, we'll have to have that debate offline because we're eating into my time. Now. Thank you very much. Uh, are you? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I ask uh, Assembly Member Garrett to come in, please? Good afternoon. Jules, we meet again. Another plenary with no mayor, but it's always a pleasure to... I'm afraid uh, I haven't boned up on the mayor's diary this time either, so... <laughs> well, well he, he was on LBC this morning. We know, we know what his, some of his engagements were. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, about um, this question of convergence. Um, and uh, uh, some young lad who was a mayor of Hackney at the time signed up for the Strategic Regeneration Framework, which you, you mentioned earlier, um, which talked about the true legacy of 2012 being that within 20 years, the communities who host the 2012 games will have the same social and economic chances as their neighbours across London. We spoke a bit about that earlier. So I'll, I'll give you opportunity as well in a moment. Um, so I suppose the question is, you know, we're halfway there time-wise. You know, are we halfway there achievement-wise? It's a question for the Deputy Mayor with his possibly current and possibly former hats. Um, each, each, you know. I, I, I would say halfway yes, but that's really based on just as a resident, as someone with experience mm. of having run the borough by virtue of my position now, because I'm not aware that the boroughs have, and this is no criticism of the boroughs, but I'm not aware that the convergence measurements are recorded in the way that they used to be. I, I, well, you I, have... Yeah, yes. I, so, 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 you know, there was the framework. Yes. There was an awful lot of expense. I think it was Oxford Economics, I mm. think it was. A lot of investment in, made in, 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 in um, coming up with metrics and the measurement uh, of those, 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 those so metrics. They ceased in 2016. Yes. So that does make it difficult to find out whether it lasts 20 yes. years. Yeah, I, 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 that's when I left. I can't comment <laughs> on, on that, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, but, but, as I say, I think, I think though, there would be um, other, other metrics that you could, you, you could use that we could go into uh, about employment rates, about um, uh, uh, education sorry, attainment, sorry, I for, I, for example. You'll appreciate that the clock is running. Yeah. So, so in terms of who decided to, to, to stop that in 2016, do, was that the borough leaders, the, the five borough leaders who, who made that decision? Um, or, or I guess it was who was paying for it. If, if you're not sure, I was going to say, my, I was going to then pass the baton over to Roxana, who, who from, from your point of view, is one of those borough leaders. Does it feel like we're halfway towards that, that gap closure plan that was spoken about in the, uh, the original intention? Um, if I may, before I directly answer that, left, um, that, that question, my understanding a decision was taken by the then configuration of the growth borough partnership to discount that framework um, and that 
yeah, that, that, that analysis framework around convergence and legacy and since 2018, certainly in the context of Newham, um, which has also informed thinking um, amongst the current growth borough partnership, which now comprises of four local authorities. Um, we've shifted um, our outcomes lens towards a model what, or towards a frame that's based on inclusive economy, where there's much more elevation given to issues of deprivation and poverty uh, and associated um, concerns with regards to what the Olympics hasn't achieved in socioeconomic um, legacy terms for specific cohorts. Okay. of communities just, just as, as a cynical person i tend to assume that if the measurement is changed it's because it wasn't showing what the person who created it wanted and so is that unfair is that the reason why it was dropped in favor of something else not um, that something else may not be good in its own right yeah. but it, it does prevent comparison you see it would be remiss of me to um respond to that specific element of your question i'd have to probably go back to the records and i'm more than happy to get the Growth Borough Partnership to provide you a written response as to what happened at that point, okay. why that decision was made, by whom, and what happened next. Okay. But, but in terms of you know, this aspiration that, that I read out from the, the 2009, that was, so that was obviously in the, in the planning phase, um, you know, is, is your sense that we are, we're about halfway through the time, are we about halfway through the distance in terms of achieving, however it's measured, that aspiration of closing the gap? I think overall all yes. I think it has shifted the dial and if you will indulge me for 30 seconds, for then. example, business growth between the period 2010 and 2021, notwithstanding COVID-19, there's been in Newham a 165% increase, in the London bor Borough of Hackney a 149 percent increase in increase in what sorry in business growth okay. in those localities uh waltham forest 109 percent increase and in town hamlet 76 percent and the growth borough average is 120 percent uh compared with employment growth how do we sorry that was your 30 seconds how, how do we only because i'm on the clock so yeah. i was watching um how do we know though that that was because of the olympics and not just everything else that's gone on Because I mean, do you have a, so do you have a control group of other London boroughs that were similar at the time but weren't around the Olympic Park? So each of the local authorities, and Jules, you may be able to advise, given your period as the Mayor of Hackney at the time, there would have been a framework around the economic outcomes that each of the growth boroughs want to achieve that aligned to the convergence framework that was used because i remember attending some meetings around convergence mm. as a councillor so to, I, i'm running very short on time does anybody know if there was a control group for comparison lynn um i think the the way i understood the convergence um, ambition was to bring uh, the boroughs local to the olympics the six growth boroughs as as were previously defined up to the average for london and so one could say that the control group was the whole of london in terms of the london boroughs if if you were measuring it so pretty okay. simple kind of concept okay. and a recent piece of work that lldc and the growth boroughs have uh, jointly commissioned with consultants notwithstanding the fact that we didn't keep measuring it, you know, whether that was in the boroughs or not, uh, has, has gone back and looked at the original convergence indicators. Roxana mentioned this at, in her opening. And some of the areas, like business growth and so on, we've gone beyond the average. Some were at the average, but others we need to pay more attention to. And she mentioned health and uh, she also um, uh, earlier mentioned poverty in the borough, which is a key I, I, challenge. I'm really out of time. So if, if that report, would you be able to share that with us? Is that, yeah, is that a public report? I would appreciate that very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Assembly Member Devnish, please. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Deputy Mayor and the Chief Executive. Good afternoon. Um, I believe that the LODC will be wound up in just a few years' time. You could probably perhaps remind me the date to make sure I get the right date. What's the issue in terms of a risk register for that, for the governance for that? And in terms, are you specifically concerned at all about the competence of any of the <coughs> boroughs to take over those powers, particularly one borough with the initials TH? 
Um, well, the short answer is um, the end of 24, end of 24, mm -hmm. yeah, the end of 24 is when the planning powers um, revert to the boroughs. Um, that has given them, and they knew that, and it has been rather, they have, it has been agreed with the boroughs um, for quite some time, so they're gearing up for that and they increase workload that would be required uh, taking on the additional area um, and as for the rest of LLD's functions obviously those will shrink over time it was always seen as uh, I think we call it a sunset organization um, uh, but actually it's it's slightly shifted in as much it's, it's no longer seen as a, a sunset organization that will disappear uh, entirely it will transform into something else and now the language that's used is is very much of the, the great estates principle um, and uh, and there will be a, a, a more than vestigial presence to uh, to maintain uh, and promote uh, the uh, the park. Um, yes, uh, 2024. All the planning goes back to the boroughs. Uh, we've been uh, planning, using the same term, uh, this for a long time. And our relationship with the boroughs has got closer and closer on this. We have good working relationships. I feel confident, very confident, that the boroughs will be in a good, strong place to take on the planning responsibilities. You know, it's quite difficult, actually. One has to think about the local plan, the local development plan, and how that works for plan making, as well as uh, development management decisions. Um, uh, and then there are technical things like, are the computer systems there to pick up these responsibilities? And therefore, it has taken us uh, quite a bit of time to plan out how those things are going to transfer over. Practically, halfway through 2024, we'll be starting to have our final planning committees. But where we're already working jointly with the boroughs on major planning applications, for example, so that we can really tie that in for the end of 24. In 25, we evolve into a different organisation. We will shrink uh, geographically to this greater state that doesn't have the, you know, outside of the park. So we will, the mayor will continue to own the land within the park and the venues, and the governance will change accordingly. Well, you both managed to avoid the bit of the question I wanted you to answer, which is about the semi-judicial powers that planning has that are being transferred over to uh, the London Borough of Tower Hamlets, which will help them create multi-million pound assets. Do you have no concerns about the governance at the moment of that borough and how that will proceed? Um, well, it would be wrong for me to comment on anything about the political governance of the borough. But on terms of planning, um, I, I've got nothing but positive things to say about the, um, the, 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 the planning department of Tower Hamlets. It deals with very large, complex um, applications because of the location of uh, Canary Wharf, for, 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 for one thing. Um, and the current um, head of planning there was obviously ex-GLA, who oversaw the construction of the London plan. Uh, from the officials for our side in this building. So I have every confidence in the planning department of Tower Hammonds. So I'll finally finish by saying uh, I hope in due course you will have a line on your wrist register if things change, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I ask for a uh, assembly member, Prince, please, to come in? Thank you, Chair. Uh, this question to Lynn. Good afternoon, Lynn. A um, couple of questions. Lynn, uh, the board, how many members of the board do you have? Uh, we have 10 board members and uh, the borough representatives. That's correct. Yep. And how many of those board members have served two terms? One term being four years, I understand. Uh, Peter, I think we, we recently, um, we recently, I think it was probably this year, reinstalled five board members, four, four board members from uh, the previous round of recruitment. They're, they're all quite new, actually, in terms of, so they were all re-recruited in 2008. Half of them were re-recruited in 2018, and the other half were re-recruted in 2020, I want to say, 21. So, so that so they're all quite new, actually. 
So of the 10 members, how many of them have served more than two terms? Perhaps, perhaps you'd like to just check and write. To Nobody. Me. Nobody. Except, except um, the deputy mayor obviously sits in for the GLA. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, my next question is uh, around the discussions you had with the PAI group uh, some time ago, as you may recall. Uh, for those people outside of the business, this is a group that approached you claiming they, they were going to take over West Ham and you had some very in-depth discussions with them about the possibility of them taking over the stadium. Um, on, the, on the 8th of December, a, a few of us chipped in, I believe uh, Assemblymember Hall, myself and indeed uh, Assemblymember Garrett also chipped in, uh, oh, and the discussion was around whether or not you could share the same level of detail of information with West Ham that you shared with the PAI group. Um, my understanding was that you uh, agreed to that. Has that happened? Uh, no, I don't believe it has. Can it happen? It can happen. Should yeah. it happen? It can. It can happen if that's um, if we're if we're minded to do so. I don't see any reason why. And I tell you, I'll tell you a bit more detail about that. Th these were not really in-depth discussions. Um, all that was agreed was a set of high-level principles, because of course. This organisation had not acquired the ownership of the football club. No. They were merely having a conversation with us about a potential direction of travel. So there are some high-level principles that were agreed. You wouldn't call them heads of terms or anything like that, certainly not. But those high-level principles certainly can be shared. And there's nothing secretive about them because, in essence, all they are is um, a openness to look at transferring the long leasehold of that building to um, an owner, if that owner is able to agree to a certain level of principles around multi-use, for example, being retained in the stadium, and we would obviously need to look at uh, the financing side of things. Sure. But in principle, it's simply being open-minded about the future of the stadium, given the drain on the public purse, but wanting to retain the wider economic benefits, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you agree then you would be happy to have that level of conversation with anybody that wanted to have that conversation? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that seems very fair. So hopefully we can look forward to that being a yes next time. Um, you also, of course, at that same meeting on the 8th of December, uh, we got to the old chestnut, which you were probably expecting around naming rights, Lynn. And we have ev every year, I believe, ever since I've been an Assembly member, had the same discussion about the naming rights. Um, have you sold the naming rights? No. Um, you know, we do have this discussion every year that um, clearly the people best positioned to do the negotiation is West Ham. And on a number of occasions, you've assured me uh, that uh, you felt on that occasion that you possibly were in a better position. Clearly, that hasn't been the case for what must be nearly 10 years now. So, And we know that the naming rights are worth around about £4 million. So we can say a conservative figure of around about £40 million worth of potential income has been lost. You can argue that point in a second if you want. Um, so is it really not now the time that you have that discussion, bearing in mind that you did agree to have that discussion on the 8th of December 2021 at that meeting, you said that you would have a discussion with West Ham, and indeed uh, Assemblymember Garrett said, so um, we can quote you next year that that conversation will happen, and of course we can't. So would you like to comment on that? Um, there's quite a lot in that, actually. I'll try to take each point yeah. in turn. Um, nobody is keener to bring a better economic situation to this stadium and this park than I am. It is me that has introduced the financial sustainability concept, not the GLA, hasn't been imposed, I put it on the table, that we ought to work much harder to make the park pay its way. The stadium is a very challenging asset and the contract is extremely challenging as well. Now, there have been two instances where naming rights attempts have failed. And I've mentioned this before in this meeting as well. Some of those, without a doubt, so part of the reason for that 
is that we haven't approached the naming rights jointly with the football club because the contract uh, requires that we do so to a certain extent. We can't act as islands. We have to work together. Now, over the years, and you know as well as I do, there have been difficult relationships with the club. They're much better. We get on very well. They're a robust business, but it's a business relationship. We've also had a couple of years where there was no chance anybody was going was to get a, a, a sponsorship deal, and they were called the COVID years, and we're coming out of those now. Uh, to the, towards the back end of the COVID year, I asked the GLA to support me in employing a chief commercial officer, Nathan Homer, which I did. And what he said to me, and I think he's right, and I think this partially goes to the reason why naming rights and sponsorships around not only the stadium but the park in more general terms have failed, is that LLDC is not a commercially minded organization. We run a public park. We make some money out of some trading around the edges, small amounts I would say. And so the brief he has been given is to drive commerciality across the park and the stadium. Now, um, he's an expert in this field. He came from Sky and previously worked for an Olympic sponsor, Procter & Gamble. Um, he was very honest with me and said, you have no commercial infrastructure in this organization. And he has spent the last 18 months building that commercial infrastructure. We now have much better data analysis. We understand our partners and we're having much better conversations on sponsorship than we have had in the last 10 years and much higher degrees of interest. It's difficult for me to put commercial details out there today, but I feel confident that we will land the right sort of arrangements for the park. As the park builds as an entity, gets a new East Bank, um, uh, uh, for example, achieves more residents and has new universities, then it becomes more of a saleable asset in economic and social terms. And businesses are interested in making economic and social gains these days. It's very much at the heart of what they do. They want to be seen as sustainable and economic social organizations. So the concept has moved, um, Keith, from not one of simply selling stadium naming rights, but selling sponsorship, marketing, and uh, wider opportunities, naming rights for other venues, for instance, across the whole of the park and not just the stadium. And that's the work that we've been doing the past the last 18 months. Now, at the core of your question is, will I give the naming rights to West Ham? Yes, I would give them to West Ham if the right financial deal was put on the table. So. You talked about £4 million. If West Ham wanted to pay me £4 million a year for the right to sell the naming rights, then we can have a conversation. Um, I just have to remind you that I'm, I'm not able or, or it would be legal for me to enter in any negotiation on behalf of West Ham United Football Club. So uh, if you want to negotiate publicly with them, that's entirely up to you. But uh, I would have thought that... the, the, the I would have thought that uh, the sensible way forward would be for you to, to have a conversation with West Ham because really what people are looking for uh, when they take the naming rights, they're actually looking for, in the instance of West Ham, I'm sure it's similar for other clubs, uh, a one billion pound, or, uh, sorry, a one billion audience that West Ham would regularly get. And more importantly, they're probably looking for the three billion audience that the Premier League bring. Uh, and, and you would know, Lynn, that without uh, West Ham being involved and without the shirt sponsorship being linked to the deal without the uh, board surrounds being linked to the deal, uh, that audience would not be available to anyone who would get the naming rights of the stadium. So there would be no point in doing that. So I just do not understand why you cannot have uh, a sensible conversation with West Ham. Um, it's interesting what you said today about West Ham paying you £4 million. Pounds. That's not of, of any concern to me. But um, you, you know, that surely working together would be to both of your advantages. Well, look, I just I'm, don't understand I'm, why happy, you can't I'm do that. really happy to work together, but I think four million pounds a year is exactly what we should be concerned about, because you um, put on the table, and you're absolutely right, that that's the estimate for the naming rights. 
Now, um, uh, now those naming rights are worth a lot more money when they're putting in a put in a pot, as you say, together with shirt deals, shirt sleeve deals, and so on. Of course, they are. But what I can't do is sell the naming rights off cheaply to a football club. Well, I, I, I'm out of time. I won't progress that, but I'm not asking you to do sell the name rights to West. I'm asking you to have a sensible conversation with them. That's all I'm asking. Uh, thank you. I want to bring in Assemblymember Cooper, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Sorry, I thought we were going to hear from the rest of the Conservatives before we moved over to anyone else. Um, I'd like to speak to... Uh, Lynn Garner and actually I'd just also like to say to Assemblymember Garrett who is not privy to these discussions the mayor wasn't invited today that's why he's not here um, so it's got nothing to do with his um, diary being full or otherwise but um, you know it's sad that you don't know about these things from your group leader perhaps I wondered if I could ask Lynn um, if you feel that um, the aim from the 2012 um, uh, statements of building legacy careers, generating choice by establishing pathways for local people to access jobs, apprenticeships, training and other opportunities, um, whether that really has been created by the development or do you think there is more that could be done? I want to focus in on jobs. Um, in all honesty, what I can't say to you is that there have been um, hundreds of thousands of jobs so if we look at the Westfield Shopping Centre, that employs a huge amount of people in entry-level type re retail jobs. What we've chosen to do on the park is focus on um, more highly skilled um, careers. So we've done a number of, inter more recently examples would be internships and so on and placements with the creative partners. Now, huge numbers of people who've been through some of those internships, and there are about 300 odd um, who've been through them in recent years have um, been placed in employment. Some of them are working with the V&A, the BBC and Sadler's Wells, which is a huge success, I think, and even with the universities, and these are uh, young local people. Um, we've also sponsored around 500 apprenticeships on the park over the whole of the period of time. Many of them have been construction apprentices, and we've recently, in the past couple of years, launched a construction training academy in conjunction with Transport for London so it does have a longevity beyond the development corporation and will ultimately uh, likely be based at the Royal Docks which is um, another part of Newham to continue uh, to bring young people through not not only if this is not about um, construction skills in the in the fact of just things like bricklaying and carpentry and so on but also in the digital skills because of course Construction is highly technical uh, these days as well. So there's a site on the park of an academy that, that brings people through. And all of the major employers, and I'm talking your Balfour BTs, you know, your Kilnbridges, your big businesses, people who are building East Bank, are all engaged in that training academy, and as that, well as the businesses that work for TfL. And is that particularly aimed at local people? Yes. It is very totally. much aimed at, at local It's all aimed at local all people. The local we do we do take we prioritise the local boroughs and where we can't uh, get interest from just the local boroughs, we go London wide. But if you go there you find that most of the beneficiaries are, are local businesses. And the good growth hub is mm -hmm. one's construction and the other one, the good growth hub, is looking at bringing brokerage through um, from the boroughs for all of the other jobs, including the creative pieces and so on. We also employ 70% um, local people in the venues and on the park, you know, looking after the park itself and so on. So the numbers are not huge in terms of those employments about, I think they're in the hundreds actually for the operators, but they are very high numbers of local people who, who work in the venues. Thanks. And I'm, Jules, I'm also pressed for time. Um, I wondered if you could say, looking at this with your deputy mayor hat on, what learning there has been from how the LLDC has improved its skills offer to the local community and how this can be used in other mayoral developments, such as, uh, you know, when it eventually gets going, the Old Oak and Park Royal development over there on the other side of London. What learnings are there? Um, well, because we're short on, I, I mean, I'd, I'd give one uh, good example. Um, uh, well, a couple. The Good Growth Hub, um, uh, which is you know 
getting people at an, a real entry level, you know, which you've heard me talk about before, which I think is absolutely crucial. Um, and also the uh, construction training centre as well. Great example there, I think with jointly with TFL, isn't it, that, um, uh, that are doing really good work there. And, and I, th I think they, they are really good examples of, um, uh, um, of, of, of that kind of learning, um, of, of that kind of interventions, curating those opportunities um, uh, 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 for entry level jobs and, and then being able to scale up from there. And something um, that you think can be replicated elsewhere then? Yeah, those absolutely yeah. should be. I think perhaps what, what is, uh, I think, the jewel in the crown of the park, it would be quite difficult to, to replicate perhaps, is Here East. Here East is a, a fantastic um, uh, uh, a series of, of things in, contained in those two buildings, of which some people said, oh, there are going to be white elephants. So they kept on going on about parking five aircraft. Uh, Boeing jets in, in the broadcast centre and no, no one ever said anything more about them but people with imagination and creativity drove through what we wanted to see there and, and say we could spend all afternoon talking about the different kind of businesses what's, what's difficult about that to replicate is the fact that of course they were gifted the buildings effectively right. um, uh, by, by, by the Olympic Games and it's what as putting my borough hat on is what I always wanted to see there I didn't want the, I didn't want the uh, aquatic centre I didn't want the stadium in Hackney we wanted the press and broadcast centre so I was very pleased that that's what we ended up with because they were always going to be um, the obvious Olympic legacy on, on jobs um, and, and actually although the numbers are good there my final point would be more than numbers what it does reputationally about these absolutely amazing high level jobs do go on in Hackney and when you get school kids going through there and it feeds out into that this excitement and opportunity and future happens here in the bar. I'm going to have to stop you because I'm Sorry. seriously out of time. Thank you very much though. Thank you. Um, Assemblymember Baker. Thank you Chair. Um, my questions are about the transport legacy of, of the Games um, and they'll be directed to Sir Peter Hendy. Um, Sir Peter, in, in March 2012, the previous mayor published his Olympic and Paralympic Transport Legacy Action Plan. Do you feel it's been delivered? Uh, happy, happy to, happy no. to take any answers from anyone else if, if you feel yeah. it's appropriate. Please, I, I wasn't responsible. No I was the Commissioner of Transport. I wasn't responsible for that plan, um, and, I, and actually, I chair the corporation rather than being involved in, it, in its in, it, in its transport delivery. So you might better uh, ask it of Lynn, actually. That, that, that's we'll fine, yes. Much as, I'd, much as I'd love to have had a, um, somebody solely from transport here, obviously, uh, we had to limit the panel. So, yeah, absolutely, Lynn, if you prefer. Uh, you, you might be able to point me to um, some of the ambitions that were in that strategy. Um, what has happened is, the, is there was a tremendous investment, obviously, in the run-up to the Games in Stratford Station, which was a, is a huge, became a huge success and is now a victim of its success, actually. In, um, in growth terms, uh, because growth has overtaken us, uh, anticipated growth has overtaken us. Um, walking and cycling on the park has been a priority and is good, but we could do more yeah. mm -hmm. in terms of uh, modal shift and so on. Some of the larger roads in and around the park are just too large. So when Westfield was built, these roads were of their time and we anticipated a lot more traffic and we're now got a couple of projects that we work in partnership with Newham on to reduce the roads and make them single track roads. These are the ones on Monfitchet Road and uh, Westfield Avenue are going to be significantly smaller with more cycling and, and walking uh, provision. And we have a plan and we have the cash for that and we've started working on it. So, and there's also a huge road that goes, uh, that goes right through the middle of the park. And that's quite challenging as well, actually, about how we, um, it just reduce its scale, if you like, as we build out the residential housing that will be around it and focus more on the walking and cycling things. We do not badly on the modal shift. I haven't got the number in front of me. It's around um, high 80% of people coming to the park coming through public transport or through walking and cycling. Uh, and I think we're at target in that regard. Where we fall down a little bit are the um, numbers of people coming to use the uh, football stadium. We still have a lot of people coming and parking in Westfield car parks. And again, these car parks at Westfield are huge. 
and they're not full. And, and actually, there's, um, there's an ongoing conversation with Westfield around reducing the number of car parking spaces, uh, which I think they are minded to be looking at in the next few years. That's interesting. Uh, might have a personal interest in that. Um, no, that's, that's really, really helpful. I'd, I'd like to um, ask specifically about Stratford Station, actually, because you're, you're absolutely right. The, the increase in provision is massively successful. Um, but, you know, it has left Stratford Station now needing an upgrade because it's a little bit chaotic, I think we say. Um, should, should this not have been predicted, do you think? I mean, it just feels that the, the work that was done on the station was quite significantly under what was needed. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure my yeah. <laughs> AM Desai has uh, um, views about that as well, yes. I mean, I, mean, I think that... We, we, you know, others on this panel will have a view. I've been working in London for 20 odd years. In, in, in my view, we always seem to underestimate the success of when we put, in, you know, when we enhance our transport infrastructure, we, we underestimate it in, in, in I and mean, there's lots of examples around London where places just quickly fill up, you know. I mean, take the Jubilee line. The the thing, you know, the thing was a fan, was fantastic put in place for the games. It's heaving at the moment, you know, in terms of the pressure there. So, so, and we and we we've experienced that in the last twenty years. Look, um, the growth has been, and this this came from an Oxford the Oxford Economic Study in two thousand sixteen has exceeded anticipated growth prior to the games by more than three times probably more like four or five times. Um, when people are coming in with significant applications, we're having difficult conversations about the transport. MSG was an example. We needed to make sure that the transport network would be able to cope with another event venue, for example, in and around the park. And, um, and therefore, we're doing a lot of work now in partnership with Network Rail, with Transport for London, and with the borough to bring forward a redevelopment project for Stratford Station and to put considerably um, more uh, 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 capacity into that station. Some of that may involve some platform changes, but really depends on whether we can get the government to focus on I investment here alongside development. And that will be a huge ask because it will be a big project. The strategic outline business case is due to be put to the Department of Transport uh, next year that will hopefully take us to the next stage um, of feasibility if it's accepted um, by the Department of Transport, who, si who sit on our, on our board. We have a, we have a board uh, that Peter chairs uh, that, that looks at this project um, going forward. Well, I think the straight answer to, would, would, you, w would it now have been the case that it should have been rebuilt more than it was for the Games? The answer is you'd never have made that business case then, but you can make it now, and that's what jo uh, collaboratively and jointly uh, we'll have to do because there is a real danger that in the early 2030s it will be so busy that yes. it will prevent further economic growth in that part of London. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, and I just wanted to, um, uh, I mean, I, I really hope that comes forward. I think for, for people of East London, it'll be um, fantastic. I just wondered whether, um, just briefly, I'm running out of time, um, uh, Jules or Roxana, as previously or now, um, what transport improvements or did it deliver for the local boroughs in terms of transport uh, oh, legacy? I'm so grateful I've got the opportunity because I would have been <laughs> devastated not to be able to say East London Line extension. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it was really touch and go whether that was going to be delivered. Um, I, re I remember seeing, um, uh, approving maybe even, uh, drafts of a campaign that kind of basically ran no tube, no Olympics, that people were prepared to run should, should people think, oh, no, we can get away with tarting up the North London line and, and that'll be it. That's good enough to get people across to Stratford. Um, the East London line has been absolutely transformative. Uh, I'm sure it has for South London as much as it has for, for North London. That connection through to Highbury and Islington, the connection, the cathedral-like connection now at Whitechapel. Mm -hmm. um, but even before Elizabeth Line, it totally transformed the borough's perception of its position in London. Uh, it made people think, yes, I can easily get to a job somewhere else in, in central London. I'm not kind of, oh my God, you know, that's kind of an hour and a half bus ride to get to West London. 
or I've got to you know let make loads of changes. It transforms like students' perception of how far they'll travel to um, uh, to for training and skills skills training, and crucially for inward investment, it totally. Tra I always used to call it the Hackney Empire test. It was if you want to go out for a night out somewhere in West London, or even say if you lived in Central London, South London. I'd love to go and see that at the Hackney Empire, but, oh, God, I come out at half past 10, 11 o'clock, I can't get home, and no cab's going to be there, there's no transport, it's just the North London line with an occasional train, passenger train between 10 freight trains. The transformation that those two lines have wrought in coming in under L London Overground and the investment, just totally brilliant. And, and once again, though, the point about the in, the, the making the case, you can never make the case at the time, and even if you could make the common sense case, you still couldn't make the business case to the Treasury to back it. So it was absolutely brilliant it's happened and absolutely transformative. It's in my top three things of what's transformed Hackney. Uh, thank you, thank you. Oh, I wanted to give um, Roxana just a, I'm really running out of time, but I didn't want to leave new amount. Um, just really building. building on what Jules said, uh, notwithstanding the overground, um, the DLR extension to Stratford International, six yeah. minutes to St Pancras, you can yeah. jump on a train to uh, the Eurostar and get to Paris, you know, who would have imagined that in yeah. East London? And more importantly, connectivity to enhance and enable more walking yeah. and cycling, that's been really, really important as well. That's, thanks very much, thanks, uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the next uh, is Assemblymember Krupesh. Oh, you do. It's me. What? I was told that Assembly Member Desai has withdrawn his questions. No, I haven't. Most certainly, <laughs> most certainly not. <laughs> That's what I, what no, I was advised. That, that was, no, I never withdrew my question. That was in relation to a supplementary that never happened. Did you hear your comments, uh, No, I'm not comment. I'm told this is what I was advised. But if you're saying that, that you... If you advise that you do want to ask a question, then I think I would ask you to, to put your hand up l l later on. <laughs> oh. um, but anyway, look, I, if, 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 if the group, level group wants to stick to this list, right, that's fine, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. But it's all this change that I get, which, which is confusing to me. If you want to ask a question, that's fine, assembly members decide, come, then we'll follow this list, okay? Well, that's for the chief whip to answer, yeah. Yes. yes, thank you. Okay, right, so my, my five minutes starts now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Um, and my question is about the demands of policing mega events and, uh, in, in this 2 you lead. Um, so the policing operation for the Olympics was huge and a success. However, one of the problems with policing mega events, as a government report made clear in 2020, is the coordination between multiple uh, agencies. So with the current an anticipated increasing footfall in the Stratford area with the ABBA arena and the proposed MSG sphere. How are you working with the MAT, BTP, British Transport Police, uh, and other agencies to meet the challenges opposed by these developments? I appreciate you already talked about Stratford Station in a tra from a transport perspective, and there's a consultation exercise going, which is about to start soon. Uh, about strat the future of the station, but from a policing perspective, um, what's your response? Yeah, uh, look, it's a it's a huge uh, uh, activity making sure that eighty thousand people, or just under eighty thousand people, following a concert can get away safely from Stratford. Uh, that's a huge responsibility, and um, it happens in the summer when we run concerts and it happened this summer it happens uh, 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 when we do get to run concerts and so on um in fact the highest number of people we had to get away from that stadium um, was far more than when we had the games because when we had the games people came for sessions and were coming and going all day through the transport systems if you go to a concert you're all leaving at half past ten or, or whatever it is so there's a huge infrastructure actually that wraps around this it involves police uh, transport um, professionals health and safety professionals the local borough so you know for a health and safety perspective we are extremely experienced in handling large crowds 
and you will know that the um, MSG application, when it came, caused us to look in really great detail with TFL partners around what the impacts were going to be. And such is the nature of the uh, Section 106 agreement that um, we have made sure that events don't clash with each other. So we've looked at the whole schedule around events at MSG, football events and football taking priority at various times because we must make sure that we can get people away safely. Now, we can't do any of that without sitting down in great detail with the police and TfL, which we do on a regular basis. So that infrastructure for that work is, is, is well, well embroiled, along with the safety officers and the event officers that knew and provide for us. Okay. I'll come back to you later. I mean, outside the, this meeting about my worries about the anticipated footfall increase, as particularly as a result of the MSG application, which was approved by LLDC in March. In the time that I've got, I two more questions, if I could fit them in. On the safety aspect, can you tell us more about the consultation that LLDC launched after the, in the aftermath of the Sarah Everard murder uh, on the safety of women and girls in the park towards the end of last year? Uh, what are the results, if any? Yeah, um, we, we've launched a, a big piece of work around the safety of women and girls in the park. We've run a big consultation, we've listened to people and we've put together a strategy. Um, in fact, um, what we found when we were talking to other organisations about this in the aftermath of the Sarah Everard murder was that was that actually we seem to be um, at forging ahead. Not many organisations have done much work in this space. Uh, we met with the Knights are, for example, at um, the GLA and did some work with her team around this as well. And the work has uh, been recognised and has won an award. And I'd be really happy to share it with the assembly members, actually, because I think it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty good piece of work. Actually, it's yeah. re really about bringing multi-agency partners together to make sure that the park is a is a safe place. I think the police committee would be interested in in, you know, in, uh, in more information. My last question, very quickly: the Olympic Park was the first park in the UK to achieve secure by design status. And a previous survey showed that around eight in ten people reported feeling safe in the park. However, the, the uh, Metropolitan Police uh, data shows that the area immediately around the park towards Stratford experiences higher levels of crime than in, anywhere else in Newham. Uh, in fact, I think the crime figures actually are the worst outside central London um, in the Stratford area for lots of reasons. So I wanted to know how we are continuing to ensure that everyone feels safe and secure, not just using the park, but the immediate neighbourhoods as well. Yeah, I mean, I would say this wouldn't I, but, you know, the park's my responsibility and Stratford Town Centre isn't. But obviously the whole thing merges exactly. together, in a sense, um, across the edges. And those conversations that take place with the person who's responsible at the borough level, the bor borough commander, are, are activated through um, Mark Hamley, who's my representative, and the representatives on the borough, on the borough side. So... And I think I think now we have a commissioner who looks after um, Newham and Hackney, actually a joint a joint commissioner. So there are high levels um, of crime associated with town centre activity. And we've got a big shopping centre yeah. there, which is, is part of the mix, obviously. Mm. Uh, what I hope is that the park is a bit of a safe space for people, and it'd be important to try and maintain that. I think we don't get a lot of crime in the park, which yeah. is. You know, it's, it's a good thing, but as you say, how can we have fingers out into the town centre? But um, Roxana might I want to come in. If I may, um, I think the point has been made well by Lynn just in terms of needing to acknowledge the significance of the Westfield Shopping Centre as a significant feature of, you know, a town centre and actually what that drives in terms of criminal behaviour and the work that has been that is being done, you know, across different partner agencies, including the police and the local Sorry. authority and the Queen Elizabeth Park through oh. great officers at the LDC to lift Sorry. and ensure that the wider area is safe. Thank you, Roxana. Sorry to interject, but I'm, I've really run out of time, so thank you very much. Thank you, Assemblymember Desai. The next is Assemblymember Anne Clark. 
Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Jules, you've talked a lot about housing delivery, and I want to come back to that. Um, obviously, since this project has started, the, the world has changed significantly, uh, and, and, and for many reasons. Um, I'm just wondering what the impact uh, factors such as COVID and Brexit have had, but also this emerging economic storm on, on the ability to deliver housing. I mean, the, the projects on the park obviously are suffering in the same way that all projects, uh, you know, are across uh, the country. Uh, build inflation costs are about 19, 20 percent, um, whilst raw materials might fluctuate a bit further and even come down. Any goods with building uh, building materials with added value to them, it's just everyone's saying it's a new benchmark, uh, and they will not be coming down. Um, clearly, there have been extra uh, ex expense that incurred uh, during COVID. Hopefully, obviously, we're all hoping for all sorts of reasons, but in this particular case, for the co impact it'll have on the building out of the housing on the park, we hope that any any, uh, any wave this uh, winter will not be as severe uh, pre as previous ones and, and have a similar sort of impact um, as, as it did before. Um, I mean, on the detail, I mean, probably... Lynn's probably better better positioned than I am with the with the facts and figures. If there was something specific you wanted to draw upon, I think in general I just wanted to know how. Obviously, the um, cost of living crisis both uh, has an impact on how affordable affordable homes are to Londoners because those these things have changed overnight. Somebody who could afford an affordable home may not be able to now. That might be suddenly out of their reach. But also um, our ability to actually build the homes, given that we ourselves and the developers themselves have an affordability crisis on their hands. Um, I'm doing some work for the mayor under the auspices of the Curse Lake Review. And um, there's, there's no doubt that we're facing completely unprecedented circumstances. The development market and the investment market even feels reasonably uh, bullish to me. We're all recognising some short to medium term challenges that I think will slow us down. But if we look back over the last 40 years, inflation rates were typically 3.5%. So, you know, I am hoping this is a bumpy ride for a couple of years, that we can ride this out and uh, return to normal. It may slow us down, yes, definitely. It's always an opportunity for the public sector to step in and help, actually, in terms of a mixed economy that we have around house building. Uh, but what we are facing significant challenges every year in the park. We reappraise um, house values and costs of construction. HPI and TPI, as we call it, and our new numbers are looking really challenging. But if we're doing that on an annual basis, that's why it looks really challenging at the moment. I'll give you a fantastic example that my construction director shared with me the other day. We're building a huge pro project at East Bank that is under uh, cost pressure at the moment, as you would expect. Um, we're getting our windows from Germany. Germany is facing gas supply issues. If um, German business and industry is told that it has to use less gas, we won't be able to get our windows on time. This is, these are the kind of reverberating impacts around Europe that we're seeing on supplies and materials in the current crisis. That's really helpful. And finally, Jules, just quickly. Um, are there, are there learnings about housing and delivery that uh, could be applied to other regeneration sites across, across London? Again, I'm going to, to turn to Lynn. I mean, I, I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to channel Tom Copley here and what he would, he, he would be saying to you now. Um... I guess, I, I, guess um, I, I think the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park is a bit of an exceptional site because... Um, what we did in the legacy community scheme, which, which was the original scheme that received planning for the whole park, in terms of the residential development, the standards are really very, very high. So sustainability standards are very high on those buildings. All the buildings are Code 4 plus. There are quite a lot of zero carbon homes been trialled in there, particularly in uh, Chobham Manor. There's just won an award, actually, of the Evening Standard announced um, this morning. Um, it's that they're sort of exceptional design. They're quite large space standards, larger than the mayor normally requires. 
uh, there are tree-lined avenues. There are all these sort, sort of additional standards required in terms of amenity space, and and we've and and the you know London has spent extra money on that to get to those standards. So there are some exemplar developments that we can look at in terms of design. So we have helped the GLA on some design guide work more recently, um, actually, including for just going back to the um, safety of women and girls and making sure that safety is designed in a standard uh, uh, going forward. Uh, we, uh, and again, under the auspices of the Curls Lake Review, we started working really closely with OPDC um, in terms of their work. So somebody mentioned economic development recently, I think it was Lonnie. Uh, we are putting a secondment in to OPDC to help with the economic development ideas that we've developed in the park and so on. But there are some exemplar standards that we might not be able to replicate in other areas simply because of the cost. So we, we did take an exemplar approach with the park, I think, that won't necessarily be able to be replicated elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assembly Member Clark. The next is Assembly Member Moemi. Thank you, Chair. And before I just ask my quick question, I want to welcome Dave. Um, thank you for traveling all this way, and I hope you get a question. But sadly, my question is um, for Jules and Lynn. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll ask you a question at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, my, my question leads on from, um, it's very similar to Assembly Member Berry's about um, Gypsy Roma and Traveller provision, but it is just to say that um, Bartrop Street um, was a TfL um, Hackney partnership rather than JLA, so perhaps you may not have been involved with that, and I've been in discussion with um, Tom Copley about um, supporting the reprovision of that site. But um, I just wanted to, um, to really ask you, um, in light of that, um, what your thoughts are about um, within the Curse Lake Review, um, as Chair, I worked alongside other members to send a letter around um, recommendations to make sure that GRT sites were included in um, the Small Sites Programme, and um, just how far along we are with that. I know that's supposed to be part of the Affordable Homes Programme 21 to 26, I think I've got my dates right, but how far along we are with that, because I think it's something that we will come back to. Well, on the specifics of the uh, Gypsy and Traveller sites, I can't give you an answer on that. I'd need to ask Philippa to drop you a note um, on that from the GLA perspective. Um, on the Kersnake Review, we're making good progress. So we've set up the, um, the working group that's got all of the members of the family on. We've set up the governance. Uh, we've got the committee in place and so on, although it hasn't met yet, we know who the members are. So we're starting to motor on some of those um, recommendations. We're doing some work with TTLP, the uh, Transport for London side of the business, on uh, deep dive activity on their delivery programme. And there's quite a lot of collaboration going on. I mentioned some of this common piece. I've just launched a piece of work on talent um, that I've uh, had approval to fund uh, through the Group Collaboration Board chaired by David Bellamy. Okay, thank you. And uh, I will ask you a question, David. Um, <laughs> I just wondered, um, just in light of all that you've heard and somebody who writes a lot about London, if you could very briefly outline what you think has changed in the last 10 years and what you'd like to see change about your part of East London. Very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, it's a very good question. Um, I think... Uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, quite, quite interesting to pick up on this argument about convergence, which some people see as a bit, a bit, a bit precursor to levelling up, you know. And look, it was a, there was a good question from Assemblymember Garrett, I thought, about how do you, how do you separate out uh, a distinctive Olympics or Olympic Park element from these convergence data? And I can remember immersing myself in these figures when they were first being produced and asking myself that very question, because there are lots of other things going on. I think. Jules might have said that school results might have been happening anywhere because schools in, in London, uh, all over London, but very much in East London, uh, have, have got a lot better. And also there's, there's the, the, so during my time as a resident of Lower Clapton, I have seen um, uh, a sort of an, an outward movement going almost past my front door because when I was looking to buy a house, and all my other people, the older people I worked with, were buy, had lovely big houses in Islington. I bought a house 
thanks to the housing crash of the late 1980s, don't get me started, but uh, to buy a, a, a little terrace house in Homerton in, East, in, in Hackney, regarded at that time as perhaps the most dangerous place in the world, which of course it wasn't. And then as time has passed, uh, people I work with, my own children, have been buying houses in Waltham Forest mm -hmm. and looking at houses in Plastow and so on. Uh, and so all of those things would have been happening to some degree or other anyway. And it's very difficult to separate out from a bunch of data. Interesting though, though they are, what the Olympics effect has been. And I think I'm more interested, actually, uh, I mean, I think convergence is, is sort of interesting, and I think lots of inequality is bad across the regions of London. But I'm more interested in alleviating poverty, and that's a slightly different thing. So what I want to see, and what I, what I hope is happening, and I think it is happening to some extent, what I want to see is long-term residents of Roxana's borough and my borough and Tower Hamlets who haven't been having a very easy time of it for years to get a better deal. And that's why I really want to see the huge uh, effort and, uh, to be made as the story of the legacy unfolds. Um, very vividly, uh, the previous mayor of, of, of London said, at around the time of the Games, in fact, I think it was just before the Games themselves, when the coalition government had come into power, and there was a fantastic handover between the Labour government and the coalition government, which I mentioned in my, in my very memorable opening speech. Now. But he said at the time that he thought that the uh, cuts to local authority budgets and so on were sabotaging, I think was the word he used, the, uh, all the good stuff that, might have, that he hoped would flow from the games and the park and so on. Now, he was a politician, it was a political point. Uh, you may or may not think that's fair comment, but what I'm saying is it's still very difficult in those areas, and I think that the, 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 the huge task for the people in charge of the uh, Olympic Park and the boroughs as they start to take over their plan the planning authorities is simply to focus as hard as they possibly can on making sure that, that local people get the best out of it and there is this psychology here, so there's a great story, if you'll allow me, that I've been told a couple of different versions of when I started to research my book, which was so kindly mentioned earlier by a couple of people. And, and uh, people, involved with, people involved with the uh, 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 Olympic Park and its creation and, and the running of it, who, who, who said that they'd heard stories that local people didn't believe they could come to the park because it would cost them money not just to use some of the individual facilities, but to actually go into the place, you know, to, to, to actually step in there. Of course, anybody can walk in there any time that they want. And that shows you that there are kind of barriers which are kind of subtle and difficult, difficult to overcome. I think that COVID, and I'm reliably informed on this, and I saw it a little bit myself, the COVID period when everybody said you can't go out except for a short period of time during the day to get some exercise, I believe there was quite a lot of people ventured into the park just to walk along the rivers mm -hmm. and what have you uh, that, than, than people who had never gone there, never really ventured in there before. So I'm hoping that there's a bit of a silver lining from the pandemic in that respect. People saying, actually, this place on my doorstep or just the other side of Stratford Station or, or just the other side of the, of the Lee Canal, uh, this is my place, you know, and I can walk in there just like anybody else. And all the stuff that's going on around here, East and uh, East Bank, which I think is going to be absolutely brilliant. Thank you uh, very much. Can be for them. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, thank you. The next is uh, Assemblyman McCartney. Thank you. And Dave's very nicely given me a bridge into my question. I'm going to ask, I think, probably Lynn. Um, do you think the Olympics? Um, has delivered the, culture, the, the cultural legacy um, that we expected? I think to a certain extent the jury's out. So I remember sitting in front of Peter and his panel when they interviewed me for my job. And my view, and it's still the same, was that the measure of the success of East Bank will be whether it's relevant to people living on the local estates like the Carpenters' estate. That's the measure of success. What we have seen is 
East Bank partners, I'm a bit blown away by this. They're very, very engaged. So every year they run a free summer school for the most disadvantaged young people. We keep the numbers low so people have a great experience. So it's in the two to three hundreds. We provide um, free meals and so on, as one often does need to do in these circumstances. And we have welfare officers looking after people. And they provide fantastic standards of um, experiences. For example, the BBC run recording studios and so on, the V&A design studios. So they're really excellent uh, pieces of work. And they've been doing that for, I think, nearly six years. So they've been in this game for a long time and the commitment is really there. Uh, that's across the universities and the arts and culture pieces. All of the buildings will be free to access. They start to open from next year. Um, there's a huge uh, public performance space outside that will be available 365 days a year. So, you know, I think the jury's out a little bit, but I think the signs are really good. And, and actually, I mentioned earlier, many people have had experiences of apprenticeships with these organisations, internships and so on. And quite a number of them have actually got work with those organisations, which for some of the local young people is pretty mind blowing and wouldn't you know, be normally expected. Thank you. Roxana, can I ask you the same question? Do you think that's delivering for your borough in cultural terms? It's getting there. Um, I made some comments earlier about um, the important voice of the local boroughs on the board uh, in terms of visioning the future of the park and programming and what that needs to cover in terms of being responsive to local communities as much as Londoners more widely. Um, and I think there's a huge amount of excitement about what the East Bank development is going to bring and their outreach across all four boroughs now is second to none actually I've been really impressed um, and I don't remove culture from both its enrichment impact on the human condition and how it can lift people in terms of their sense of well-being um, from the importance of culture and creativity in terms of pathways to jobs and skills. We've got the ABBA, um, you know, the music um, voyage um, there that's attracting loads of people locally as well as from across London. Um, there's more and more um, animation happening in the park in a way that simply was not there, I'd say, five years ago. It's really lifted significantly in the last five years. And if I could just kindly uh, be indulged, I want to give an assurance on the back of um, what, you know, was expressed as a plea by Dave. Please be reassured, the mission, the purpose, the vision collectively of all members of the board, along with the Growth Boroughs and the GLA, is very much addressing issues of fairness and equality, not just through the vehicle of the LLDC and what the Olympic Park can bring, but also what we want to be doing for East Londoners at local borough level as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, can I ask um, Assembly Member Plansky, please? Thank you. Uh, Lynn, if I can direct my questions to you. These are about culture and creativity. Now, Hackney Wick and Fish Island were used as case studies, um, particularly in your local plan 2020 to 2036, highlighting it as a creative enterprise zone. But it strikes me that a lot of this was about redistributing existing space. What's being done to create new space, particularly for small creative artists? Yeah, uh, the one thing I don't have in my pack are the numbers uh, around that, but I can let you have them. So. At LLDC and within the local plan, we have a very uh, proactive strand around affordable workspace and workspace that is protected for creative uses, particularly in the context of Hackneywick and Fish Island. Um, and we've seen some uh, real successes there. So look, it's 
there have been some people displaced, there have been some, po some people rehoused, if you like, in terms of that um, artist and creative community, and there's been some new provision. So I would mention the Peabody development in particular and the ground floor in there where we've got some uh, affordable workspace and we've got a new development coming forward um, in Hackney uh, as part of the Hackney Wick Master Plan that also protects affordable workspace. So we do make some balanced arguments, for example, around affordable housing and affordable workspace, and in particular in the Hackney and Fish Island context. But I don't have the numbers in my pack, unfortunately. Um, if you're happy to write to me with those numbers, yes, that would be brilliant. Thank you. And Dave, if I can turn to you. So um, earlier on, we talked about things like the V&A and the BBC being in the area, and of course that's encouraged. But I'm really interested in this small kind of freelance uh, creative sector. What do you think should be doing more to encourage that in the space? Oh, God, um, I don't think I'm really... <laughs> you asked me a question. I don't think I'm qualified to answer that one. I'm not sufficiently uh, knowledgeable about that particular thing. I can talk about the East Bank a bit more, if you like. Um, actually, I'm happy to hear about the East Bank. Yeah, OK. So, I know. <laughs> so, so all the individual partners in that are uh, sort of uh, bending, bending over backwards to make sure that they, they do their kind of outreach stuff and make sure that people feel that, they, that, the, that this new thing, when it's complete, belongs to them. So, you know... You'll be interested to know that, for example, Sadler's Wells has do, been doing, sending out people to do dance stuff with uh, primary schools, both on the park and, and around the area, uh, as part of what, what the schools call their enrichment program. Um, and uh, the VNA uh, have been doing a lot of been doing a, a lot of stuff as well. The BBC, I spoke to uh, their guy Alan Davy. He emphasised, as have other people involved in the in the in the design of the east bank thing that it's going to be designed in such a way as to invite people in U, uh, ucl uh, lay a lot of stress upon this and they talk about their history as a university that uh, in in the very beginnings was set up in a in a, in a what was then quite a disreputable area of, uh, and it invited people to do courses there that wouldn't have been allowed to go to university and they're very keen to uh, to uh, recreate and, and revive that part of their history. And as I said, the very design of some of these buildings is 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 such that people can walk in and and feel part of them. So that's the theory. And of course, we'll have to see how it all works out. Um, I've run out of time, but I just want to say that's brilliant. I also hope we'll look at the small creative sectors as well. Yes. Thank you, Chair. The next. Uh, can I ask you, um, some member decide? No. You, you were doing that question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Assembly member Hirani. Yeah. Okay, you were doing that again. Okay, well, that, that, that brings, it <laughs> brings it to Assembly members. Member side, but I know, but the, <laughs> but the vice chair is not here, right? So I'll, I'll come back, okay, if I may. Um, Assembly member Peter Fortune. Thank you very much. I'll be quick because I'm under time pressures as well. This is for Lynn and Sir Peter. I've got the Q1 uh, performance um, and finance pack in front of me. Um, highlighted on the risk register is the decision around the HMRC and the corporation tax. So can you give us a quick update about that, about whether or not that application has been approved? And also around treasury management, uh, management, where are you at the moment with borrowing? And is there anything, have there been any conversations with the GLA about um, rate fluctuations for, for payments back. Maybe if you give me a headline and we can pick it up as, outside as well. Uh, yes, on the corporation tax, no, we don't have a response on that. And the conversation with HM HMRC has been going on for a long time, yeah. as you might imagine. Um, so no, we don't have uh, uh, complete clarity on that, uh, hopeful of, obviously that it comes out in our favour. Uh, on the Treasury management side, um, I think those discussions are probably live right now, given the uh, what's happening in the market and so on, because we've had to report pressures. As I say, we review all of our investments on an annual basis. So I don't have the detail in front of me, uh, Peter, but happy to um, drop you a note on the Treasury management side and long-term investments That's there. There's, there's other deferred um, tax liabilities as well, isn't there? Uh, there... I think there's generally a question around um, VAT, okay. um, but I'm not the expert in that field, have to admit. Okay, I'll, I'll take my budget hat off and, and, and we'll pick that up outline. In terms of legacy, because it's also about the games itself and not just the park, um, 
and I, I declare an interest because I'm a trustee of the London Youth Games, I wonder what work has been done with the, the, the Youth Games and their excellent programme across London. Um, and also, whilst I've got Jules, just any update on the Crystal Palace diving pool, which you'll know a lot of people in my area are very concerned about. Should we do the youth piece we'll do first? The youth games first? So I think my, my understanding is that there's, there's been a really strong relationship with young people back back from um, 2012 to, to now. Uh, my experience of it is that we've managed as a board and an executive to uh, make that even stronger over the past few years. So we have something called a legacy youth voice that's been kicking around a while. And around sort of 2018-19, that we formed a legacy youth board that has got some real strength to it. So to give you an example, it now runs its own annual conference, uh, which we support um, along with some of our board members. And um, we've got it to a state by which the one of the uh, former chairs of the legacy youth board is now a full member of the LLDC board. Oftentimes at boards, you look around the table and everybody's over 50, right? So it was really important to get a local young person sitting there. And we've also managed to get some um, young people onto our planning committee as well who have um, uh, architectural knowledge locally. So that's been good. So we do Could quite I, a sorry, lot. Sorry, Lynn, I'm so tight for time. Maybe, sorry? Maybe, maybe you could write, because I'm so tight for time. Maybe you could write to We to could bullet point that out, no problem. What yeah. we're doing. And then Jules, have you got an update on the pool? Uh, it's a long-term project, as you know. <laughs> no um, update on the pool. <laughs> I'm happy to Okay, thanks very much, I've got to stop for time there. But thanks, Lynn. I'll... Thank you. I, I will ask the question now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. We've got time left. I have, yes. Okay. Um, my question is um, for Tanny. I, I think she's joining. Are you still with us remotely? Yes, uh, I am. Great. Hi, thanks. Um, my, my questions are about the grassroots participation in sport, but particularly I want to find out what has been the impact of the Olympics, right, and or subsequently on the participation of, of uh, uh, people with disabilities in sports, and have we done anything to, to improve their position and their participation in, in, in sports? Yeah, so, um, you know, the Games is a, a shop window and it's definitely inspirational. So, you know, there's a, a young disabled man called Andy Small who watched the 2012 Games and he went, you know, years of training, joined a club, uh, became a gold medalist in, in Tokyo. So you have those incredible moments. The reality is that um, 2012 didn't change the lives of disabled people en masse. Um, it did provide inspirational moments. So there are still huge challenges in engaging in disabled people, um, having the right opportunities for them to participate and to get onto a pathway. Once they're on the pathway, um, I think it's slightly easier. But there's been quite a lot of research over the last couple of years that, that has highlighted the, the challenges of getting actually disabled people, children from poorer, socio poorer socioeconomic backgrounds, um, in, in sport, COVID's added a layer to that, which has, has made it uh, more complicated as well. So um, it comes back to, I think, my original points in terms of unless you're going to radically change or do a different type of investment across the whole of the UK, these things will also be challenging. And the other thing I think which is um, we have to take into account is that a pool of talent that we have in terms of disabled people changes quite radically. Uh, the seatbelt law, which saved huge numbers of people's lives, cut the number of people who became paraplegics. Uh, and that was a challenge then in terms of sport. My own condition, spina bifida, um, through folic acid and termination, means there aren't many children being born like me anymore. So it's not a static population. Um, as it is in, in, in mainstream sport. So um, I think everyone who works in sport knows there are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of work going on to, to try and bring about that change. But also that can't happen in isolation of things like the disability employment gap, accessibility, um, and you know other challenges uh, around access to public transport, which exists for disabled people as well. So um, I think if you've got... Uh, say a disabled child and you're fighting for education and transport and health and social care sport and physical activity is not top of your priority list so um, as much as the games were stunning and amazing and I would you know seriously consider wanting to do it again 
um, it it doesn't fix all the problems that relate to to issues or challenges of disabled people genuinely being included in our society, and, and we're still a long way off genuine inclusion. Is there anything that particularly that we, we think we can do from the London Assembly, right, or the Mayor of London can do to increase the participation of people into uh, into sports who have, uh, as you say, uh, have disabilities? Uh, who have economic background which, are, which deprive them or, 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 or come from ethnic groups which don't uh, take a part in, 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 in sports very much. Is there anything you think we can do more to assist them? Uh, th there's always a lot more to be done. Um, actually, um, you know, it needs to join up to education, making sure that disabled children, whether in mainstream or special schools, have access to high-quality PE. Uh, it's making sure they have access beyond school games, but, you know, athletics has schools championships is making sure they have the ability to, to compete and, and take part there. Um, sadly, there's not one lever to pull, but if you look at what's happening at Olympic Park in terms of the affordability of swimming, um, they have a number of events out there which focus on, on disabled people. Uh, Panathlon is an event that's held there for, for children with multiple or more severe impairments. There's a lot of good stuff going on. But there's there's always more that needs to be done. And I think the one thing I would say is that um, in we, we put a lot of pressure on disabled children in the way we don't on non-disabled children. So if a disabled child just vaguely engages in sport, a lot of people start telling them they can be Paralympians. And that's pretty hard. Um, you know, you've got to be training 12 to 15 times a week. You've got to have talent. You've got to have opportunity, a lot of luck uh, along the way. We don't put that pressure on non-disabled children. Um, and, and I would love to see just more be done to just allow disabled children to be whatever they want. We don't tend to tell disabled children they can be teachers or lawyers or whatever. And um, actually, even the barriers to, to you know, being in public life for disabled people are quite a lot. So um, there's not one lever to pull, but there's lots of things the Assembly can do to have an influence to, to make those opportunities better. Uh, and uh, I'd love to follow up a conversation uh, with anyone afterwards about what some of those levers could be. We'll pick it up now. I'm, I'm out of time, but we'll pick it up uh, offline. Thank you. Can I ask Assembly Member Best? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my colleague just briefly brought up the London Youth Games there, and I wanted to quickly confirm, hopefully, from either you, Lynn, or, or Jules, um, whether you can confirm that with the uh, with young children being able to, to use uh, Olympic stadiums and facilities over the last 10 years that that legacy will continue and they will continue to use those facilities uh, over the next 10 years and beyond yes uh, we, we are in the process of procuring new operators for all of the uh, venues that we control uh, not the stadium actually but certainly the aquatic center and the copper box arena and that will include uh, contractual obligations uh, for pricing and uh, local access going forward, the same promises that we have today. Um, I think as far as the Legacy Youth Games, we were able to do some work with the Legacy Youth Games uh, this summer uh, in some of the venues, and that worked really well. Uh, We've, we generally have timing issues with the youth games in terms of the stadium uh, because they happen obviously in the school holidays and it's, obvious, it's usually on when we're, when we're preparing the pitch for football. So there's a timing uh, 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 issue there. But I know that uh, Jeff Thompson, who sits on our board, has asked me for a specific conversation about the uh, legacy youth games uh, going forward. and how it can work uh, more effectively at the park. Sorry, Lynn, just move on slightly and be very brief. Um, there was £350 million of taxpayers' money spent on building the London Olympics Press and Broadcast Centre, now here east. Could you let us know how much of that is now recouped? Uh, I... I don't have the answer to that question. I'd have to. I mean, I heard I heard Jules say that the buildings were gifted back in the day to Here East. What what we what we can say is how successful Here East has been in terms of its return That's more locally. Fine. Um, not that I wouldn't like to hear, just on timings. 
but yeah, so it, there's no re recoup on that three hundred and fifty million pounds. Um, well, there, there was the sort of a commercial deal done between um, obviously uh, uh, was it I City and uh, LLDC, but that that didn't represent what the, the building the, 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 the cost of those buildings were, and it was never intended that it should. Yeah, we that, get, that's we, why I highlighted the fact they were effectively gifted to the Olympics. That, uh, to, to the Olympic body yes. that could then do a commercial deal on it, but it isn't one of those things that probably would have, 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 have stacked up as, as a commercial. Yeah, we do get a commercial rent, mm. so we get a turnover rent that's based on uh, the level of occupation of the business and that business's turnover. And, and turnover really rent. quickly on that, sorry, because I am only because of the time, it's not your fault. Um, is the, the, the there was in the press that figure of rent that was estimated to be fifteen million pounds would be generated from that over two hundred years. Would you recognise that figure or not? I'd have to go and have a look. At, um, to be honest, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll another so personal point I was going to make, Peter. You, what you've got to factor in is that a lot of that cost went into building them for the games, of so which I there think, was. Thank a, you. That a was the, that wasn't the question. Thank you. You can't. You just simply can't attribute the cost of building those buildings just to their use. Now they were used for the games. The 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 the, 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 the chair that was appointed by the previous mayor wanted to just pull those down and build housing. So all that money, three hundred and whatever million, would have been entirely for waste. Okay. Thank you for the explanation, um, Assemblymember Boff. Um, mayor Fiaz, um No new housing developments on the Carpenters' estate for 10 years. Are you, are you proud of that record? It's not a record for me to be proud or not proud of, because it wasn't my record. But what I am proud of is in the period since 2018, I have stopped a joint venture that would have seen nothing close to the 50% homes uh, social rent that will be delivered of the 2,172 over the lifetime of the development scheme which has now started following the successful green light by residents who were involved in the co-production and co-design of the master plan that's been approved. Have your officers um, told you that the plans for 50% affordable are actually unviable? Officers. Your officers. So, officers of Newham Council have not stated that the 50% quantum of homes at social rent on the Carpenter's estate are unviable. What have they said about the uh, achievability of, of that target? They have said rightly, as with all of our housing delivery schemes, that we've always got to be alert and uh, aware of a whole range of risks associated with any develop development scheme, be those inflationary risks, costs that can be attributed to COVID-19 have added to the cost pressures of schemes, but the Carpenters Estate program that has been given the green light following a residence ballot is not unviable. So still no more homes. Thank you. I'm out of time. Uh, thank you. Uh, this brings us almost to the end. <laughs> okay, we've now reached the end of the question and answer session. Thank you to all our guests for answering our questions today. The Assembly has some further uh, items of business to deal with, but you are welcome to leave the Chamber and the Zoom call now. Uh, can, I ask, um, can I ask the Assembly to agree the motion set out the agenda in my name, namely that the Assembly knows the answers to the questions asked? Noted. It's proposed that the London Assembly uses the 3rd November 2022 plenary meeting principally to hold an answer and question session with invited guests on the cost of living. Can we agree to the recommendation? Agreed. The next meeting of the London Assembly is scheduled to be the Mayor's Question Time meeting, which will be, take place at, the, at 10 o'clock on Thursday, 13 October, in the Chamber at City Hall. Uh, yeah? Great. Uh, 
Um, I think that's the end of it. Okay. The next, the next no urgent business received today. That brings us to the end of today's meeting. It will now be a short meeting of the GLA. No, it won't. Oh, oh sorry. Will they? They, this brings to the end of today's meeting. There will now be a short meeting of the GLA Oversight Committee. So members of the committee are asked to remain in the chamber. Photos for the amigo. And photos for the amigos outside the chamber. If you. Pardon?